You are listening to the Mountainside Podcast, and our returning guest for this episode is my friend Jeremiah Wilbur. He's a former Army Special Forces operator, outdoorsman, and much more. He's the founder of War Party Movement, helping to raise awareness and combat the human trafficking epidemic plaguing the U.S. Jeremiah and the War Party organization are doing some amazing things. But above all that, I always enjoy sitting down with Jeremiah, having a few laughs. This was a great episode. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And then there's some my horse like, of course you speak. Like, bro. All right, let's dive into it with that. If you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> How you been, bro? Good, good to man. see you, man. Can't complain. Good to see you guys too. Awesome to see yeah, you, okay. Yeah, cheers. Bro. It's been a long time. I've been we've been trying to link this up. And you're a busy guy. Yeah, man, for sure. Yeah, we've been we've been crushing it too, man. It has been nonstop for us and I was uh, just in Vegas yesterday and boogied back and got to go to Brooklyn tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah, something like that. But Sounds fun. I fucking hate it, dude. Like, <laughs> keep me city. in Colorado. Yeah, I hate you know? the city, man. So I I'm just, like, oof. Yeah, I'd rather just be in Colorado. Yeah, Colorado's enough for me, dude. Oh, shit. That's pretty good. It's kind of weak, though, huh? Should have made it a little stronger. It's not bad. No, it's fine. It doesn't suck. No. It's a black rifle. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. They sponsor Which us. one is that it's one? Good. Uh, the AK Espresso. Oh, nice. I like that. And uh, they make a vanilla one. I think it's called Freedom Freedom Fuel or some shit like that. It's pretty good. Oh, right on. I'm not I, much of a flavored coffee guy, but this has like just a hint okay. of like. I, mean, I usually just mess with the Just Black just because I know what I'm getting. Yeah. Like the flavors, oh, they're kind of like, eh, I don't know. I get sent all these oddball ones, and typically yeah. those are the ones that I give away. I'm, I'm like, not a. The uh, mid white. Halloween roast or all this yeah. like pumpkin spice shit. I'm, like, I'm not a uh I'm not a coffee or like wine connoisseur or anything like that, you know? I'm just like I don't know any of the specifics. I'm just like, ah, this one sucks. This one's good. Right. I don't know what it was. So if I find one, I'm just like, yeah, I'll just buy that one. I forgot to ask you if you want cream, but we don't have no, any. I so don't. I'm I like, <laughs> you can black. either drink you know. coffee black or fucking. No, I have I have hair on my chest, so yeah, I drink it black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the oh man, it's something about we were just talking about hunting or something. Like nothing tastes better up elk hunting, I think, than like the coffee with the grinds that are like still in it. You know, yeah, like yeah. out of the old steep little thing you just throw in the campfire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that stuff's the shit. And uh, I was doing some pour over stuff up there. I, Stanley makes a little like thermos uh-huh. that's a pour over thing, right? Um, you know, the old school Stanley thermoses that keep coffee yeah. off for like fucking three days <laughs> yeah shit. yeah you know those are wild but they make a they make one that goes on top of that and it's a pour over oh okay so that was pretty badass but nice i like the instant coffee too from black rifles not yeah bad I, it's I had um the steep bags or whatever the bag but, that's what dana brought and yeah. those things are the shit they're like like a tea bag yeah they're, that's i mean i if I, I had some left over and i used them at the house like i wouldn't even make regular coffee i was just using the those steep bags until they're gone. I was like, these things are yeah. awesome, dude. especially if you're like backpack yeah. hunting. Oh yeah, because they're light and yeah, yeah. That's the way to go. Yeah, they're awesome. I, I like those a lot because usually in uh, in like hunting camp up in Wyoming or or you know if I'm guiding here um, like off horses for an outfitter, we do everything like super old school, like you're talking about. You know, you just boil cowboy coffee, um, and we use uh, we use mostly we just use black rifle or you know cheap coffee that we can take into camp like just buckets of it dude yeah because you know like there's nothing wrong with folders dude. no I'm a, yeah no we well we've been blessed late like the last couple of years like you know black rifle like hooks it up so um but it's been awesome dude because we just you know that that coffee it's such a cool little booster you know like when it's cold as shit and then for us the guides we have to take care of all the stock and all the horses and everything so we're up first so typically a morning is like when all the stock starts to come in at like four in the morning, we'll catch them all, put them in the crowd, and then immediately go into the cook tent, start a fire, start coffee, you know? So it's just like, and then it's, I feel like hunting's also the only place where I drink coffee at like 10 o'clock at night right. and, st- and go straight to sleep. You're just like, I need coffee. It's warm. You got to warm good. up. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah. I don't think people really realize that haven't done it before, especially like during archery season or something like that. And, um, in the past couple of years, I haven't been lucky enough to go off a horseback, but yeah, I should rent some horses or something. I th- I think like what I tell people, um, hunting off horses in that way is just go with an outfitter. You know, like 
do a little bit of homework, figure out what area you want to hunt. Um, you can do plenty of research on outfitters. Um, most outfitters are kind of old school cowboys, so they're going to use Facebook. It's probably their biggest um, tool. The ones that have like a really awesome web website and like, and I'm not knocking those guys, um, but don't sleep on the guys that their website sucks and their and their Facebook is okay, but like all it is is pictures of hunters slain um and like very fam like small family kind of oriented yeah i mean and it, and it might not be that big but it's it's more of like especially the the families that go into the the wilderness um the wilderness hunt families a lot of those are outfitters are family you know small family owned oh i see what you're stuff. saying so like it's vet a, them by their facebook by how many photos and pe- yeah, yeah, stuff you they're can, getting yeah you can look at it and then a lot of sense. a lot of times those those small family outfitters they're booked for years like you know, like if you were if you were to uh, call someone here, you know, in Colorado, like you oh, start looking like luck. Pagosa Springs or or someone at a steamboat or something like that. Um, if if they are that small kind of mom and pop one, I mean, they're probably really good. Um, customer service is going to be awesome. The way they take care of their clients, and then you know they're probably booked for the next three or four years. Um, and then when you start looking at other states uh, like Idaho, Wyoming, Montana because you have to acquire points or get the draw a lot of times even those are like you'll call an outfitter you start kind of researching an area um and you need to book them like two years out to say like hey i don't have enough points yet but here's what i'm trying to do yeah so that and that's been kind of my experience working for um work for outfitters in i've worked for especially um, if you've never hunted before because i think that there's so much that you guys do as far as like putting you on animals, calling for sure is huge. Well, think, Animal behavior, like well, it, I would say even if you've hunted before, the thing with outfitters on horseback, there's a lot that goes into um, the stockmanship and taking care of the horses and yeah. and uh, the horsemanship, you know, that you're getting. So I've had I've talked with people who've had bad experiences, you know, where they're out with outfitters where the horses are bucking or they're they're having wrecks when they're packing in and packing out and. And, uh, you know, and that some of that stuff just happens. Like it, you're working with animals, you know, you, you never know what can happen. Right. But there is a way to, um, in my opinion, to try to vet some of this. But um, even if you're an experienced hunter, like do your homework, you know, have some conversations with those with those um, outfitters. Um, I worked for three different outfitters in three different states, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. And every one of those are small family businesses, and they are always in direct contact with their hunters, I mean, from the moment that they book. So, like, sometimes nine months out, I know which hunts that I'm going to be on and where and where, who's coming and, and what they are. So um, sometimes the hunters will only, you know, want to talk, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're, um, you know, this is like their fourth or fifth hunt with that outfitter so and those are the outfitters you want to find you know what i mean we're like some guy from florida or texas is like every year he's doing everything he can to book you know uh colorado outfitters out of um out out of meeker you know like he's doing everything he can to get to, to book that right um and i think that's a good way to try to kind of vet what you're doing because you can get i've seen people get kind of had the horror stories of the outfitters, you know, and that, that sucks too, you know, as a guide. Right. Uh, and, and at the same time on our end as a guide, it's like anything in the cowboy world in general, the, the pay is dog shit. Like, <laughs> I mean, the guys are doing it cause they love doing it. it it's not necessarily like, Oh, I'm going to get, make, I'm going to yeah. make a bunch of money. Um, so oftentimes, you know, the people that they're trying to hire, like, it's hard to hire badass guides because you know the pay's not very good. Like it's got to be guys who just love it, or um, which is what you want in that situation. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And and typically, what you'll see, what I've seen in the in the kind of hunting guide guide world, is um, just the junkies. Like your typical dude. And here's an example: um, the guy ski patrols all winter at like Keystone, and then as soon as you know spring starts, he's like scouting for the outfitter he's going to work for and he is guiding fly fishing right like he's on a on a raft somewhere guiding fly fishing 
And then as soon as like July hits, he's starting to pack clients in on fly fishing guided. They just want to be out. He just wants to be out. And it's all this like seasonal work, you know? So it's like this 35 year old dude who's single, maybe maybe he's married or got a girlfriend, but you know, no kids and just lives that like mountain man kind of bounce around style. Sounds amazing. Doesn't it? It does. If you're like, don't have, you know, if you don't have a family, you don't have a family at home or something or single, I could do that. But that's like your typical. Go make snow or something. And then hundred percent. I have a buddy of mine that's single uh, shout out to rain that he kind of does that. He works in rock and roll and then, in the winter he loves to ski so he just goes and makes snow or whatever yeah. so yeah. yeah and i mean or you know, grooms at night whatever yeah and i think like here in colorado um a lot of people can understand that like they have right. friends that do it or they see it you know um it's kind of like that surf bum mentality but yeah. you're in the mountains right it's like yeah, exactly. a mountain yeah. bum yeah yeah and there's a lot of like that's what i think is cool about um Those guys to me and those guys and gals are the ones that kind of connect the dots between like the outdoor space and the hunting world. And what's wild to me is you'll see two industries that are both like conservationists, want to take care of the planet, but literally just like fight each other and talk shit about each other and one hates the other and vice versa. And then it's like hunting brands are now trying to make mountaineering gear when like mountaineering companies already make it really awesome, but they could just collab right. and make it like camo or something or whatever you know and it's just kind of weird so it's just really cool to see people in that industry like a guy or a gal that is a ski patroller that someone thinks is like this super left hippie save the planet person um and then also like guy tell cunts because yeah, they, they might drive a subaru Who knows? yeah exactly you know <laughs> but but it's really cool to see that like kind of mix of people yeah. and i think uh colorado wyoming montana have a lot of that you know i think that they do too especially yeah. like when you're in the backcountry and you run into other hunters or people that are just recreating, yeah, it's always still kind of no matter. I mean, I always try to no matter what my political values are or whatever. I'm not thinking like, oh, here comes these liberals up the trail yeah. or whatever, right? <laughs> these di- goddamn Democrats. Normally, I'm gonna greet them and be like, hey, how's it going? You know, where are you guys going? Yeah, oh, cool. Have a good day. Or, you know, like this year hunting, I'm for the first time in a while probably 10 or 12 years i went solo just Mm because my uncle my brother was down and out with an injury and uh my uncle that i normally go with couldn't come into town from montana and and stuff so it was just like well fuck the only time that i and i had to work in a kind of an off schedule but i was like fuck it i'm just gonna go by myself and i ran into so many dudes that were just fucking awesome they were like hey if you get something down yeah let me know or if they're in a group you know whether they were out of state or in state or New hunters or yeah. old hunters or whatever. They were all pretty. If I'm on a trail, I try to talk to every single person that I'm passing. Um, I don't necessarily talk to everyone at the trail head if, if, there's a, if it's real congested. <laughs> but, uh, but I do try to talk to everybody and see what's going on. Some of that, too, is like just to find out where they're hunting at and what yeah. they're doing. Um, cause then that helps with pressure and kind of, I can play the wind off. Sometimes of their you can use their advantage. Use their, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or just to see like. You also, know, you don't want to blow yeah. those guys out if they're sitting on 100%, something. Hundred percent. Like, you don't yeah. want to. Well, that and then like the other side, and like not to talk shit, and, like sound like I'm this badass hunter, but like, uh, you know, you get. I ran into it was just funny because I can picture these nerds in my mind. I ran into like five <laughs> dudes from Ohio, and then they were just, you know, just lost, man. Like, I mean, yeah, they had Onyx. I knew where they were at on the map physically, right. but like, just it was like, I think it was four or five of them was just stomping through the woods with bows, man. And and you know, it was like, okay, where are you guys going? Like, I, I want to know exactly where you are. <laughs> so I can like, um, that and then I'm always like, not safety Steve, but same thing. I'm like, hey man, I'm out here. You know, I know this area pretty well. If right. you get something on the ground or you guys get into trouble or whatever, like this is where our camp is at just walk over to that camp and say, Hey, my buddy's hurt or whatever it is. Or even if, you know, even with your in reach, like tell them I'll, I'll put my map, my camp on their map. Mm -hmm. Um, so that way, because the four, all the, everyone who's going to come rescue any SAR or anybody that's going to come out there, um, they know exactly where our camps are. And even oftentimes outfitters even kind of um, facilitate a lot of that, whether that's through sat phone or, you know, actually bringing the helicopters in or just kind of, communicating being like hey have you seen these guys or whatever the case is um so i try to like pass that information and just you know just be a good steward of the land and just like hey we're all out here like if you need help i'm here you know so because the worst thing like the last thing you want is 
even if they're nerds from Ohio, like them getting messed up and it's like on the oh, news yeah, yeah, yeah. or no, you don't want something to happens. Anybody, this yeah. is bad light, you know, in, yeah. in general, I feel like hunting, um, I have a love hate with hunting on social media. Um, but I feel like it's such a sensitive, um, topic and way to advertise or market or whatever you're doing. You, you know, I don't know the words I'm trying to use, but like, it, it's touch and go. It's like people either love it or they hate it. Right. And it's one of those things where like anything negative in hunting, there's people out there looking for that and trying to really pull that out. That's and, why I don't and, do the and, grip and, and grin flip. photos. Like I don't, no, me neither. I don't yeah. ever No, I do it for just, my clients, but I don't, I don't take pictures of stuff. I put them. It's my personal preference. Like, yeah, I don't know, but it's just, it's just another, um, you know, I look at it like it's one more way with like hunters and people that are experienced can help you can help the guy that's not as experienced oh, yeah. can you know make sure that nothing you know the, like i said last thing you want is someone to get injured or hurt or just be a news story or or a social media story the guys that i you know. crack me up are you know the guys that you run across that you can tell they're new at it but then they sit there and they're trying to bullshit you like <laughs> <laughs> like yeah i was in the bulls yesterday or whatever yeah. you know and like so you know, just be honest with people too, and you probably get a lot more help. Because those guys, I'm just like, <laughs> all right, well, cool, man. Have a, you yeah. know, have a nice day, have a nice yeah. trip, or whatever. Yeah. And you know, it's wild to me. The last podcast we just recorded in here was with a uh, game warden from Colorado, um, game and fish, Scott Murdoch, fucking awesome guy. We've had him on three or four times, and he's a back, or he's a backcountry bow hunter, you know, yeah. off a of horseback and stuff, and he does a lot of solo hunts. So he's a hunter himself, but like we were talking about when I went out solo this year, I mean, it's pretty warm still. I went, yeah. you know, the last week of September and it was still fucking 80 yeah. degrees a couple of days or yeah. something like that. And, uh, you know, how much work it takes to actually get a bull cut up first yeah. off, right? Just yeah. even feel dressed and then get it out is even, yeah. is even crazier. So I just set a limit like, okay, I might stay out overnight out of my backpack or whatever but i have a base camp or my truck is yeah. two and a half miles basically yeah. from where i'm at so i know for a fact like if i shoot a bull in the evening i got all night right then yeah. i'm good in the morning it's a different story you yeah, know like weather. i still got 24 hours yeah. but you know tuck it away someplace cool but some of these guys i've ran into before where we've been way back and they just don't have any plan if they do shoot something. They're no. like seven, eight miles yeah. in. It, well, the, you know? I mean, the amount of times I've been on horseback, um, seeing that, you know. And you this want is, another shot of this? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I, when I say I have a love hate with social media and hunting, um, I'll kind of give you my uh, a couple of things I hate. One, the biggest thing that I cannot stand. And I know that some social media influencers or brands probably don't do it on purpose, but it's an insult is when you hunt private or with an outfitter and you don't tag that outfitter or that private ranch that you're on, you're taking credit where credit's not due. And you're also back to the small businesses, family owned businesses of outfitters. You're taking away from that from them, right? So if you're this big name hunter, right? And I'll use Cam Haynes for example, because he made a post that I thought was awesome. He was talking about um, San Carlos Reservation. So that's all native ran, and yeah, I'm partial because I'm Apache, mm -hmm. um, but it's all native ran outfitting company, um, family owned business. Like he gave he gives like shout outs. He says where he's at. Like you know he tries to do a, a good job of of that and I, and I respect that i really like that so if like if other hunters when you go out especially if you have a big platform but here's the thing it doesn't matter if you have 500 followers 500,000 followers if you put an animal on the ground and you didn't physically do every single thing on your own give credit where credit's due if your buddy helps you yeah. pack it out just because nowadays people are so good at social media you can't tell me that you are sponsored by all these companies and sponsored by all these brands but yet you forgot to tag the people who took you out i've had to sign ndas for people that i've guided on hunts and that's fine because mm -hmm. it, at the end of the day it was for the outfitter but and I'm not saying I needed any of that credit. I'm just saying like, you know, 
maybe when that show came out, maybe they give a little bit more shout out to the outfitter or whatever it is. Or, or you know, the other thing that I see back to Cam Haynes, um, debone your meat, guys. Like, this is the most ridiculous shit I see on Instagram is guys full being quarters like, and just full yeah. quarters in the backcountry and then acting like it's this cool, awesome, prideful thing to pack out this giant backpack. And it's like, tell me you're 300 meters away from the side by side without telling me you're 300 meters away from the side by side. So like, even when I'm on horses, um, depending on the terrain, it, a lot of times in Colorado, because all these trails are so well maintained because of mountain bikes and, and back, you know, hunting and angling, like it's the biggest, you know, uh, revenue source in Colorado, which a lot of these mountain bikers and stuff don't know, but our trails are pristine compared to other trails. So when you're on it with horses, it's not as rough. It's not as crazy. You can put on. It's um, not like going into the backcountry Wyoming. No, or it's Northern definitely not. Montana when I'm something. in, when I'm in the Bob Marshall or the wind rivers, like one, it's grizzly bear country. So you're deboning everything, but two, the terrain's so rough and it's so hard on the stock. You need to make those loads as light as possible. So unless you're by your vehicle, there's no reason for you to be packing out bones. Um, that to me is, and the reason why I point those out on social media is because that to me is part of the bigger problem where, yes, I love these influencers showcasing hunting, um, willing to put themselves out there and take all the fodder yeah, from, from, themselves. yeah, <laughs> dude, people are just, some of the comments that Pete, that, the that the, you know, the vegan crowd or just people who don't believe in hunting is, is crazy. So, so I commend someone like Cam Haynes to like make that his complete identity of I'm a bow hunter. I kill animals for a living. I feed my family with these animals. This is what I do. I respect that. And I think that's needed and awesome. The gaps, the things that are missing are teaching people how to plan. So just back to what you were talking about, about your truck, right? Like if I'm in really good shape, like I know the shape I'm in and it depends on who the hunters I'm going out with, right? Um, if I'm going out with a dude I know is a badass mountain man and like we can push 10 miles in on foot, I'll go 10 miles in on foot. With oh, him. it's di way different because when I, you have a team, right? Exactly. Yeah. But I know that like that guy that I'm with can walk, you know, 10, put a 30 mile day in and be fine. Most people cannot do that. Um, I'm not trying to brag in any way, but like m even myself, the terrain might not allow you to do that. Right. I'm t when I say 10 miles in, I'm talking probably seven or eight miles on a trail in, and, and you could be doing, kinda, you could be doing easily 3000 feet of elevation climb and descend oh, over and over again, oh, you know, 100%. depending on where you're at hundred percent. So like. There's a reason why guys that chase sheep and goats and those kind of things. <laughs> That's a train. whole nother level. They, I mean, they, these dudes train, 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 train. Um, but so what I like to tell newer hunters to do is to kind of draw like a two and a half, three mile circle around your vehicle. And then that way, like, even if the train's gnarly, cause three miles away from your truck could be a 4,000 foot climb down and out of something or yeah. whatever. Right. Like it could be super gnarly in the mountains, but that still gives you kind of an eight hour window, you know, even if the terrain's crazy and you're only going three or four miles, you know, it still might take you. Well, you eight, also got to factor in the time of deboning it and cutting oh, it up, man. Yeah, that's 100%. a whole nother. But, but what I mean is this like few it, hours. Involved. It's just keeps you in that planning process of being like, Hey, I'm not that far away from my truck. It'll be a long day. And once you start multiplying, you know, three and a half miles by X amount of trips in and out and like five, long six day. trips. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and not on a trail, like, you know, deadfall. Cause you know, let's say everyone who's put an elk on the ground that wasn't on a private ranch knows where they go down at. Right. And where they yeah. are. And it ain't, it ain't, they're uh, deep a dark trail. holes. Normally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think like that's one of the biggest mistakes and for, to get back to like social media, I think the pro is that, you know, more people are getting out hunting, more people want to feed their families this way, more people are experiencing the land and why it's so amazing versus, and then the other side is like, it's become a business. So everyone wants to market, everyone wants to sell themselves, everyone wants to do something. 
But it's like, hey, all of you, all your companies that started this, whether it's Sitka or whatever, it's like you were a small family business at one point. So don't make these badass commercials and all this shit and leave out Stetter Outfitters that packed you in, busted their ass, made $5 a day to get you, to put you on those animals, right? right. So for me, that's, I will always call that out. I, I make videos about it all the time on social media. Um, and I it's love just, that too. And it's just one of my things, dude. It's just like, if this is as American as it gets, everything that we do is like, you know, it's like made in America. Like it's all these products that you can only buy here. And it's, it's something that most countries, um, other than like, if you're, you know, native or something like you're not experiencing hunting and, and harvesting your animals to feed your family. Like this is a pretty, you know, North American concept and a lot of other places yeah. don't get to do what we do, you know, unless you're in the jungle of South America or Africa or something and you're like physically live off the land. Right. Like, but like most people don't, most countries don't hunt like we do. No, and, and they go to the grocery you know? stores. I mean, that's, yeah. or, or yeah, farmer's markets, whatever. Right. If it's a third yeah. world country type situation or wet markets yeah. for that matter, you know, well, well most people but, are in cities. Yeah. So, so that's what I mean. It, and it, it, to me, it's like, you know, all these really cool brands and these companies and these influencers showing, showcasing this and, and really pushing, um, I don't, I don't call it a sport. Cause like for me, that like, it's how it's we, not really, yeah. Uh, that's how my dad put food on the table, you know, as a kid, when we lived that's in the only reason I do it, man. And I, <clears throat> I encourage people like, I'm not, as much as I love hunting and as much as we talk about it here on the show and I don't ever want to come off like I'm some sort of professional. I'm one of the worst fucking hunters out there. Probably if you look at like <laughs> all the tag soup that I've made, bro is oh, like right. so much, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've bought in so many lot tags that I haven't filled. So yeah. I've never like trying to like, you know, put myself on a pedestal right. as, a, as a bow hunter. Well, right. But I enjoy it. Yeah. And one of the things that I enjoy about it is the phone goes yeah. off. Dude. Oh, yeah. Like I'll take yeah. some photos here or there and yeah. I might post something like after the yeah. fact of just like how good my trip was, but to be out there and be posting the whole time. Yeah. I, know, I mean, you know, cause you're an influencer and that's yeah. kind of your thing, but like that's a whole job in itself. And I really think it takes for me personally, it takes away from the experience. Like there's oh, yeah, something absolutely. about just watching a sunset and absolutely. watching it set yeah, and then plus hiking out in the dark. Plus like, unless you have like some badass camera or something like your phone's not gonna, right. it doesn't look the way it looked to you. Um, yeah, and I, I just, what you just said to me is 99% of hunters, even the most salty, badass hunters I know, um, and social media back to the influencer hunter influencer, they, that's their brand. Like if they don't put animals on the ground, then that, then they yeah, look like a it's failure, a business, right? right? It's yeah. a business. So they have to constantly put animals on the ground. And um, very Yeah, I was few... saying more on an individual basis. I think that that's one thing that scares me about the trends that we're creating with social media and people in general is they're not actually living in the moment. Yeah. So instead of going to a concert and watching a concert, well, they, they got their phone out and are oh, yeah. filming it, right? Yeah. So they can go back and then watch it through their phone. You're more know, worried I about think it. Like, I think it's more of like, um, so I'll go back to like, but I don't even know where to start at. Okay. So for me, when I started social media, I wanted to, I really started it to raise money for, um, for nonprofits. I was, I was doing the grand traverse, raising money. And I was like, well, I've just retired. I'll start social media. Like, there's no other way I can get everything out there. And as it started to grow, it was more of like the DMs from guys and gals saying like, you know, how much I motivate them or thank you for this or thank you for that. Or so I was like, oh man, like this is every time I would get mad at social media and be like, I don't give a fuck about this. I'll get like another DM or something like, all right, right cool. So I, but I always promised and for one, it's like, I can't be fake. So I'm always just going to be me and like, well, there's a big difference between and you and like, like, cause I genuinely know you, you're yeah, one of my buddies, yeah. you're a bro, you know, like it, it, you are yourself on social media. And then I've met other people that are a complete opposite of what they portray that they are. Yeah. You know, and well, you watch them post about it. It's and then like, the thing too, is like, what's frustrating for me, especially running, you know, having like the nonprofits and, and the business side of social media, it's like. People, these content creators literally, like if, if I make a reel 
it's like 30 minutes of my day gone that I'm like sitting there trying to like, and I'm not like tech savvy or anything, but I'm like, ah, trying to like look at these right. videos or whatever. Um, but it's like the content is so badass. Like so many people have professional cameras filming something, you know, and people will be like, Hey, post more cowboy stuff or do this. And I'm like, how? Like, I, I don't, I have two hands, bro. Like I don't right. have a GoPro. I'm not, excuse me. Um, you, you know, know I'm like, a film I crew falling. Yeah, like yeah. I'm a film crew. I mean, a lot of those influencers like Cam and stuff, they, they have you notice crews. they're not yeah, selfieing yeah. themselves, no, you no, know, no, the no. whole time. No. And even for the podcast, it just got to be too much for the demand. Yeah. So now we have a full on production team. So yeah. basically, they make all those clips and shit for me. Yeah. I don't have time to sit there and do Dude, that. No, and it's There's no fucking way. And the thing is, is like people it are eats so, up so much time. Well, people, I, I look at it too, is like people are so good at it. Like I'm 42, I didn't have a computer until I was like, 40 like like you know like <laughs> my wife's like you need to buy a computer i'm like ah. um i mean i i use a computer from what i needed it for when i was in the army you know uh and you know and half my special force career i, I was an 18 echo which is communications and people are like you don't know computers i'm like fuck no i know how to use radios and like <laughs> you know like what i need the computer for right um but i think that now the younger generations are just growing up knowing how to use software, knowing how to use that. So like your amateur videographer that literally can record stuff with his cell phone and put it on his computer and edit it makes the dopest shit. So someone who's doesn't either have the time and the skill to do it, you're now you're lacking. So, so I made a, a post yesterday on Instagram about like, I'm, I'm so sick of all the Millie Vanilli shit. Like what is up with these grown ass people lip syncing? Uh, like movie quotes oh, or like video or, or songs and stuff. Like it's so stupid. And, and this is why I love following you too, dude. man. Because like <laughs> the whole, uh, it's just fucking hilarious, dude. Like you always make me. You should be a stand up comedian on your own. Dude. Like just a raw cowboy stand up, like cowboy stand up for something. Because you make me laugh on a <laughs> weekly basis, bro. Like. The Navy SEAL workout, or what was it, the Navy oh, SEAL the handbook video. cook or some shit? <laughs> yeah. 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 That was, yeah. But, dude, so it, I don't know. I just feel like authentic content has become something that is dying. And I, and unfortunately, I even see authentic, awesome people trying to, you know, combat the algorithms or do whatever. And this is what I'm giving them benefit of the doubt. Uh, combating the algorithm so they're almost buying into the you know the trending audios and the trending right. things and and i get it like i said i run a business off of social media you know and mm -hmm. and it's it sucks i mean we do too i mean there's a ton of good stuff that happens i wouldn't know you probably if it wasn't for that right like Dude, we I, know some same yeah, similar man, friends I've, and stuff but social like, media has been an amazing amazing tool for me retiring from the army um you know, just the amount of awesome people I've met, I would say, you know, that alone has just been well worth the bullshit and the hassle of social media. Right. Um, I agree. Um, and, and, and this is what I do, though. I personally, the way I handle my personal account and the business account is I don't I don't play into any politics, bullshit, negativity. If if you're you could be my brother and if we all you post is trash and it's stupid i'm gonna i'm not gonna follow you i'm gonna unfollow you i'm like bro i'm not i'm not following you you're shit stupid um whereas i think people don't do that and they and it's so easy to get sucked down these rabbit holes of like jit of whatever your opinion is to just pile onto that opinion so like if you're you know if you're an anti-abortion person then like the only opinion that you're going to listen to is like abortion's bad no abortion blah 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 and it's just feeding 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 it just keeps pushing you farther away from like understanding someone with a different opinion and, and i'm not saying you need to follow that like if you have like a hard religious stance on something or whatever like that's fine but be careful of how easy it is for these algorithms to send you into these just dark places and get stuck where well, not the, to mention it's like only one opinion. The whole Elon Musk buying Twitter and how many yeah. bots they discovered and like, oh, yeah. you know, there's a whole sinister side of shit that's going the, on behind it that's propaganda. Yeah. And I even see it, and I'm sure that you do too on your feed. I, we have a lot of friends that are former operators yeah. and you're one of them included. Yeah. And all the shit, I swear to God, I get propaganda, dude. Then I don't know where it's coming from <laughs> on, you know, shit that's happening in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. I don't know to believe if it's real or not, or yeah. like, 
I don't know, man. I, yeah. I'm one of those dudes who just like, I, yes, I spent 22 years in the army, yeah. but I'm very, I'm not going to say I'm anti-government, um, but I am. I, I understand history. I, I'm fortunate enough to grow up very multicultural and, you know, lived on an Indian reservation, like seeing this. And what's crazy to me is that like the government has constantly throughout our history of existence has implemented uh, things it, on society that were horrible, that were unwilling to be like, oh, this is fucked up or well, it's not fucked up. Right. And, and like, I don't necessarily, I don't even just have to use my people and natives for that example. It is a hard example to use because, you know, you, there was an expansion westward. There was a, a bunch of things, but look at like World War II where they did the Japanese. So if you were a it's Japanese, insane. they just put you in a camp, right? And it's like, well, that was the government. The government also thought it was a good idea to kill like all the buffalo on North America because we wanted to, if we kill the Indian, you know, yeah. kill the buffalo, kill the Indian. And using the resources. I mean, it was well, a lot of it was market hunting too, right? You everything, had to feed these people. Everything. Yeah. Well, it's like, and you look at that, and fast forward to 2022, like nothing's changed. It's just it's just on a different level. And if you don't think that like whether it's mining for your dude, 100%, 100%. Whatever, 100%. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but like a lot of dots just don't make sense. Like, you know, and, and everyone thinks that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are different. But when you look at them, who actually runs them and leads them, it's like, no, no, they're the exact same bird, just two different feathers, bro. They both fuck you. One, like, one fucks you in the mouth, one fucks you in the ass. Like, yeah. you're still getting fucked. Like, it doesn't matter. And I think that, like, most Americans, if they're able to have a rational conversation, understand that, and they sit in the middle and a little right, a little left on some social issues, but they generally understand that. But what's happened with social media is it, it, it's easily can push you to the fringes. And like I said, where it doesn't give you uh, counter arguments of an articulate nature when you think of something on social media, it just stacks more and more bullshit of the same exact opinion you have. And it just reaffirms what you're oh, thinking, right? Like you can find whatever you're looking yeah. for on the internet, right? 100%. Like, yeah. Well, you can find something that justifies your opinion. The thing that like going to the army was my favorite thing about the military was it was like all walks of life coming together to accomplish a common goal. And most people don't get to experience that because most people stay where they're from even if they move they stay in kind of the same social economic standing and i think a lot of people underestimate the social economic standing and how powerful that is because we like to combat like everything's racist and it's like no i believe there's racism but i believe it's a, there's more social economic issues at play because you know, poor white America, Appalachia, or country, wherever, rural is the same as, you know, Baltimore City, Maryland, or what, like, it, it's the same But issues. it's not. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, it, and it's like, so. <clears throat> I get what you're saying. Yeah, and like going, going back to that, like the military, what most people don't understand is like, if you're a white guy from San Diego, right, and you take a white guy from Chicago, Oftentimes, what social media has made us do with the media, what the propaganda, they've dehumanized us. So what they do is they make both white guys named Brad, one from San Diego, one from Chicago, they make them identical. And the reality is they both couldn't be farther apart from each other. They have zero in common. That not like They're not the same person, right? Like the guy from Chicago is like this typical what you think of Chicago guy. He's a firefighter. He loves hot dogs and sports and oh, fucking, yeah, yeah. you know, like that's him, right? And then the guy from San Diego is like, no, dude, I ride a BMX, I skate, like I smoke weed, I like burrito, Mexican food, like this. So it's culturally, they are, they might look the same, but they're completely different. Different spectrums. And same with like if you had a black kid from the inner city and 100%. one that grew up in the South, yeah. you know? 100%. Yeah. And, and I think that like oftentimes, you know, social media, like to use as an analogy has removed those filters and just like you said like made that black kid from brooklyn the same as the black kid from alabama mm. and the black kid from alabama was like bro all i want to do is fish and like like that's what i like to do or whatever and it's like these stereotypes that society and images that society has portrayed on us we automatically take them and i think that social media can almost reinforce that so going back to the government right 
not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but it's like there's too much shady shit the CIA's done from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, like when it's all came out to be like, uh, you're telling me they're not messing with us right now. Right. You're telling me that like, you know, and and I think that I mean we saw it firsthand with the pandemic, in my opinion, oh, yeah. and like it was definitely a way to keep people in order, right? Yeah. Like you had to, I guess, at that point. <clears throat> So it wasn't some sort of pandemonium, but still, they definitely, it feels like a power overstep to me. Yeah, and I you think know, that, And I don't know if they knew exactly what they were dealing with, but it was definitely a power overstep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And it's just like, you know, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like every person, we're all hypocrites. It's hard not to be a hypocrite. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when you just look at society – you know, and, and, and gender, and you can take any argument you want and whether that's like global warming, for instance, it's like people spouting the global warming stuff. It's like, well, you're literally taking pictures of polar bears wearing 300 pounds of plastic, like to keep you warm in the Arctic where you shouldn't be anyway, just let the polar bears be. So like everything's a contradiction right. everything's a hypocrisy and it's hard to kind of find that middle ground because if you only look for negative then you're then the adversary of, of that argument is only going to poke it like oh you're in why'd you bring all that plastic like you're 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 say you're uh you know you're for the planet but you your entire vehicle is made of plastic and blah. like there's always an argument or just the electric the car thing the same sort of yeah, thing exactly yeah, well, it's, like, a, it's yeah. a it's an oxymoron it's, right. it's like you're like <laughs> Okay, That's but crazy. it's it's and I think that you made this just reminds me that I think that you made an incredible post the other day that I read and it just really hit home to me and it it was a bunch of uh like kids lined up native kids oh yeah yeah, yeah. and it was something about history, history. and I'm probably yeah. gonna butcher it but it yeah. was something like hey history is here for us to learn from not forget about and wipe away yeah. whether it's bad or good. Yep. You well, should that's, take it for what it is, you know, and it's that's like, the thing. and that's what we're doing right now. It oh, scares yeah. the shit out of me with my kids, like going to like a public school and like, it does. oh, that's erased. We don't want to talk about yeah. that. You know, yeah. like well, genocide's bad or whatever, whatever the case every, is. Everyone. Yeah. History to me is a big one that again, going back to the government, um, we we just are quick to erase it and forget about it if it's negative and we don't want, want to bring it up. Um, my one of my favorite sayings in life is one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, and you can flip mm. that. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And going back to my time in Afghanistan and Iraq, like only because I worked hand in hand with commandos and live with. Iraqis and Afghanis, um, did I see the culture in those people? I don't feel like was I the freedom fighter or was I the terrorist there? Because I know those people and I and I know what they are fighting for. At the same time, I've interrogated and and had prisoners and and gotten gunfights with guys that we you know bag out now they're here they're still alive, and the way they talk, the things they're saying, I mean they're not wrong. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're, if I'm able to look at it and I have a crazy different view on being a warrior than most people do because of the way my family raised me, but I have respect for those warriors is like what I still fucking chop their head off. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. But at the end of the day, right. like, they, like I, I understand. So going back to that phrase, I feel like I genuinely understand that phrase more than other people do. And the thing about it is, is like everything in our country that history has, people want to bring up, but only one side of it, right? You know, it's like, did, did the cavalry stack babies on sabers as a game? Yeah, they did. Did Geronimo stack Mexican babies on a pike? Yeah, he did. And war is terrible. It fucking sucks. One of the things you do in war is scare the shit out of your enemy and make sure that they know they never want to be around you ever. Right. And I think that in those aspects, especially when you're looking at, you know, uh, just that kind of brutal environment, that's normal. You know, no one wants to talk about, you know, where slaves sold into slavery versus being stolen or all these small things. And as ugly as everything may seem, 
that your culture may have done or may have did, you still have to talk about it. It's like you can't go to Germany and act like the Holocaust didn't fucking happen. You know what I mean? Like, no. You guys should still be sorry about it. You should still be like, oh, shit, touch the subject. But we're like, "Uh," you know, like – and I think that like keeping those camps open and being able to walk through, like I went to, I went through. Um, it's an incredible, man. Yeah, I've been to a couple. Of, I've been to Dachau and like some of those. Camps or when even I was there. just walking around the cities and looking at some of the history. That's one of the thing I I got bored later in my rock and roll career with touring, so I went and sought out World War II, mm-hmm. like just stuff like chunks of a building missing yeah. from a mortar round or what you know whatever. Yeah, and it's. It's yeah. pretty. It's all over there, man. It's uh, crazy. Uh, They've it's rebuilt so much. bridges in Germany. Yeah. Like in Cologne, well, there's a bridge like, that was like completely in the water, and you can walk through it and still see how the many wars holes. they had. Oh, you know, so it's like insane. World War One, World War Two. Is it wasn't back to back for but centuries were, though. You know, they're yeah. what were they twenty years apart? Yeah. Um, but I think that like, especially in our country, with the woke ideology. And I think that the conservative, you know, the right, if you will, is just as at fault because instead of bringing up the, it's always what about, instead of having an articulate answer that is in a sensitive nature. So whether you're talking about slavery or something, right? Somebody white's like, yeah, well, the Irish were slaves too. And like, and you're just like, bro, no one thinks, you know, it's like I had a, here's an example, like Columbus day. So I'll get into it. I'm sure people give me shit for this. I don't give a fuck. Columbus, it's the weirdest fucking holiday we have, in my opinion, in the United States. Is it gone away now, though? No, it should be. It it should be indigenous. It should be indigenous people's day. But it's one of those things where it's like, one, okay, Columbus, if if you just lay out the facts, right? Columbus didn't even set foot in North America. He was lost (laughs) and made his way to the Caribbean. And the Tejano people were like, yeah, uh, you're we've been here like we this is what we have you know and he never made it to north america so to say that this guy discovered something it's false right we already know that like if you want to talk about white europeans coming from north america to north america we already know the vikings were here you know hundreds of years before the spanish came with or excuse me with he was italian but spanish he yeah. flew for, or he sailed for the spaniards before the spanish came right um it doesn't just make sense. If you wrote it on paper and asked like a seventh grader to it's read this. It's almost like a fairy tale. Yeah, they'd be like, thing. well, this is dumb. Like, why are, we, why are we celebrating him? Yeah. And then, so for me, I look at it and I'm like, so I'll, I I do kind of go out of my way to highlight some holidays that I think people on the right conservatives would look at and be like, this is fucking dumb. One is Columbus Day. Because I feel like one, it doesn't make sense that we celebrate this guy. He never made it here. He didn't do anything. And, and then he was also like a fucking terrible person. And people will like argue with me in comments and be like, oh, he's, have you read his biography? And all this, I'm like, his autobiography? Like, you think he's going to write that <laughs> shit about himself? You know, like, and, and it's just one of those things. That was like, his social media back yeah, in the day. And you, yeah. you look at it, you're like, okay, this dude didn't discover it. There were already these badass people here. Um, when you look at like warrior culture, the warring class, like how badass we are as Americans. Majority of the, like, if you look militarily speaking, every single thing that we get, we get from natives. And the reason why we were fucking awesome at it was because we did what the natives did. The reason why we fucking kicked out the fucking British is because we listened, we fought with the fucking Mohawk and the Mohegan, and we we adopted their fucking style of fighting to bring it to the enemy on a scale that they'd never seen before. So much more effective than just so much lighting more up in a line. So much more and, effective. Yeah. So, like... When you look at that aspect of it, I'm like, what's more fucking American than these badass people who lived here first and then taught and took care of regardless regard as much turmoil and there is a lot of negativity when you start and you talking. you want to talk it, about freedom. It's like, like that right. culture, right. It's pretty. you're pretty right. much free to do whatever you want. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. why are we celebrating this person and not actually highlighting well, the, the of people yeah. of this country? The other one, another one that I like to talk about is, is Juneteenth. So a lot of people were like, oh, I'm one of those guys who I'm like, hey, if we're going to make everything a holiday, then fucking make it a holiday. If we're if we're only going to have Christmas and New Year or whatever, then only have that. But since we have 40, fuck it. And now that you want to make Juneteenth, a lot of people, especially on the right, look at it as like, oh, here we go. It's just a black hot pattern to the right, pattern to the left, pattern to black audience. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let me let me tell you what happened. As a constitutionalist, as someone who's yeah, libertarian, fill me in, I don't... as someone who's like, so people who, the same people who want to like talk second amendment, first amendment and like constitutional rights. I'm like, okay, 
two years after the war was over, after the Civil War was over, American citizens in Texas were still kept as slaves and had their rights withheld from them for two fucking years after the war was over. It wasn't until uh, June 19th, and I forget the year, um, that they finally got word that, hey, the war's over, you guys aren't slaves. You guys ain't been slaves for two years. So they're just kept in the dark. Kept in the dark. So when you fast forward to 2022, there's analogies there. They're mm -hmm. like the, the anti-COVID people or the Second Amendment, the, the, the First Amendment people. But instead of connecting those dots and using it as an example for their argument that would actually help them, especially if you talk to someone super left, they look at it as like, oh, we're pandering to the fucking black people. It's this, it's that. And it's like, right. no, 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 we're not. Like, don't look at it in a color sense. Looking at it as an American sense. This and that's is a, just it. Is It's all viewed, in my opinion, a lot of it is viewed as a contest, whether I'm right or you're wrong or yeah. whatever. Is is, And that's not what it's there for. No. And, it, and then back to, you know, social media is hard because it's like, I don't ever argue with anybody in comments anyways. Um but it's, I just ignore everything, yeah, dude. Good or bad, but I'm I, just like whatever. <laughs> having a followers now, where like if I put a post that's like that, that's kind of controversial, you know, mm -hmm. to, to people, um, that that followers will be like, "What are you talking about?" And like they'll go back and forth with gotcha. those people, yeah. which I'm good with. Um, but anything that's like, you know, I just don't do the negative. Just I'm just like, bro, I'm here to be positive. I'm trying to show you a different perspective on things. And again, I think that. Um, Going back to, you know, most Americans were, you know, the two two guys named Chad, right, from di from different places. Um, we're so much alike, but we're so different. But sometimes if you're able to just take yourself out of every all your experiences and what you know from where you are and replace that with what this person and what they're going through, like, we don't do it's enough more, of that. You're 100% right. I believe it's more culture than it is color of skin. Oh, or actual yeah. race, right? Yeah. 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 Well, cause we're like, we're literally like, I don't, I don't even know if it's of other countries kind of have the same thing, but like, you know, what's white boy shit, right? Like if you're a black kid and you like to skate or something, they're like, oh, you do white boy shit. You're like, right. what? No, rock and roll's badass. Like, or I like to skate or yeah. like vice versa. You're like a white dude. And you're like, oh, look at this. And you're like, no, dude. Like I just, and I sometimes like music, yeah, whatever. Or, or yeah. sometimes you're just a product of like, who you grew up around and who influences it's you. It's your environment. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, so, so I think that, uh, just in general, instead of like glorifying some of those really cool things, sometimes people look at it as an extreme, you know, like if a guy's a skier and he's the first black skier to win an Olympic medal mm -hmm. or something, Instead of like celebrating it, someone on the right will look at it and be like, "Whoa, why does he have to be what?" And you're like, "Look, man, like yeah. it's kind of a big deal because of the stereotypes we put on and ourselves." The outdoor, in this country, industry, the outdoor industry is huge on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's and we're just as much a corporal culprit of it. I mean, the diversity that we've had in here is not great. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, but it's just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's based, it's an outdoor show yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much yeah. for the most part. I mean, yeah. it's turned into something more than that, but yeah. And that's the, I think that's We the, do have it, but it's. If you were in like Texas or Georgia, it would be, and I know with a hundred, without a shadow of a doubt, I've lived in both of those states, you know, when I was mm -hmm. in the army. Um, and some of the most like badass, like hunting, fishing motherfuckers I know are like black dudes from Georgia, you know? Yeah. Like, and it, and, and uh, I think that like, unless you're you've experienced that you would never guess that, you know, you'd see, um, my buddies, we retired at the same time together. Uh, he was a team sergeant in the same hallway and, and you know, he's just, just, he's black dude, but he's just this badass like hunting, fishing, mountain man type dude. He's from Georgia, you know, he's from South, South Georgia. And, uh, that's outdoors is his thing. That's what they that's do. What he, yeah. That's what, that's what he does. Um, but that just kind of, it's, it's an example of like how we basically put stereotypes on ourselves and, but really it's about where you grew up. Like my buddy yeah. Max and lives up in, you know, grew up in Washington and, yeah. and spends his time in the Cascades as a photographer and yeah. a mountaineer and a snowboarder and stuff like that. Yeah. But well, I'm big on like, I, th I think it's really cool that minorities get into the outdoors and not just be like, you know, that it's any different from minorities than it is for white people. But um, 
I think that what's back to the kind of social constructs or um, those kind of uh, stereotypes we put on ourselves is that we're like the, you know, black and brown people are like the original people of outdoors. Like this is our, <laughs> our roots, you know, yeah. like we're f like, this is where we come from. So, you know, and everyone knows like all the stuff that you get from nature, like how healing nature is and mental health wise and all these amazing things. So to me, it's really cool to see that. And that I, th I think that like to break that stereotype, I think is definitely needed to show that like, Hey man, no one cares what color you are. Not only for mental health, I think the adversity that you face sometimes out there is really oh, yeah. good and life lesson-ish, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I learned, <clears throat> I'm so fortunate I grew up with in an outdoors family and like I think some of the biggest adversity I faced was a kid and hiking into a spot over glaciated peaks yeah. and like breaking down crying like, dude, I don't think I can go anymore. <laughs> and they yeah. were like, pick your ass up. Yeah, keep going. Get your fucking pack back on. Yeah. Yeah. We're about to make the summit, oh, yeah. you know, like yeah. that sort of thing. I think that those things are yeah. instill work ethic. I think hunting definitely puts a value on a life. When you take a big game animal and you see yeah. how much blood and and everything else that comes along with it, uh, yeah. you know, just field dressing an animal, yeah. deboning it. Absolutely. Like it, it, it makes you appreciate yeah. life a lot more, especially when you're, yeah. 10 11 years old or something like that yeah, you never see anything like i think that. it i think it's a way to also like bring you back to reality of who we really are as humans because you know uh not just back to like the minority thing but like mm -hmm. if you take most 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 people's argument would be that like hey you know most people from the inner city or something don't have the opportunity or whatever and like and i, and I get that like they live farther away from from you know you're in the city unless you're in it like is Denver, not cheap Denver, either to go do no it's not you know, yeah it's definitely not um and and it and it's a skill set that you have to learn because we have removed learning that skill set from our society you know over the last 70 80 years of just mm -hmm. how easy life is right and then you'll hear on oh, here's an example like on rogan they'll talk about like they'll go into their weird shit about how like someone's going to plug this thing into your brain and you're going to like talk to each other like telepathically and blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, you guys are so fucking lost. There's no running water in places in the United States. And people fucking don't know that. It's like Indian reservations don't have fucking running water. Yeah. Like inner cities are fucked up. Like you think that like some kid from fucking Baltimore city, Maryland is thinking about telepathic old fucking shit. And if it comes out, you think he's going to plug himself into the matrix? Like, no, he's trying to fucking survive, dude. Yeah. There's still people in our country struggling to survive. So I think that like what we've done is made ourselves bigger and completely keep removing ourselves from the human experience. And now we're to the point where like, I think yep. it's very humbling too going to some of those spots, like traveling the world and going to favelas and stuff like that in yeah. South America and seeing what those people have to deal with and their work oh, yeah, ethic dude. and what makes them happy. Oh yeah, dude. Is so humbling, bro. Just like, crazy. Or and you it's can so get that here. right here it's in the so United States, like you said, like going on to a res or yeah. or, or or something like that. It's but uh, it's well, it's life is so easy here. Yeah. So you know that also ties into social media, like all these things everyone's at each other about or whatever. It's like, well, life is so easy. We have the ability to do that. Um, and then if you were to take like on a percentage, you know, of like, and I'm not saying it. it now it's like it takes such a good skill set to like go into the mountains and or in the wilderness somewhere and just be out there for three or four days like most people can't even fathom doing that um even if they were supplied all the gear and 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 it's like well, and there's they just can't that do. too i mean there's people that dial it back even further from that like my buddy donnie incredible dude he made these stone points for us here and uh you know, he's a napper and that's how he hunts. And like, he's dialed it back. Like, he's like, I had all the badass shit, mm -hmm. former Marine, you know, was super into rock climbing and backpacking yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And he just fucking decided one day, like, yeah. I'm just going to go back to the roots and yeah, that's awesome and do it that way. Right. So it's like, in a sense, you don't need to have all that stuff to go out and enjoy. Like, no. as long as you have warm clothes, they used to hunt deer in red flannels. Yeah. I mean, I still do. Me too. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to put on the Sitka, yeah. you know, no. $500 camo. And yeah. like, there, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of misconception in that too. Like you have to have all this. And I think that it's kind of the world that we're living in. Like I got to have this to achieve this. I got to have that, you know, like, yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. Let's take a break. (laughs) All right. I'm like, oh, I'm drinking so much coffee. (laughs) Ah, that's better. We're back. (laughs) Black rifle going right through me. Yeah, dude, I'm old. I got to pee. (laughs) I know. I was thinking about putting a bucket under the table, but I was like, yeah, it's a little quiet in here for that. Dude, I want to talk to you. We burn. We're burning through the time. I think we got it all out (laughs) on the political side. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Which I I want to talk to you about War Party. Yeah, and what you're doing there because I think it's a fucking amazing foundation. I'm glad. I don't see anybody else out there doing anything about the issues that you guys are tackling at War Party. I think it's something that kind of flies under the radar and doesn't get a whole lot of attention. So I definitely want to give it a platform. And I mean, short of genocide, I think it's one of the worst things in human culture that can be happening. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, So I guess if I was to start, you know, um, with what War Party movement is in general, um, I started it as kind of a, like, how can I affect that MMIW issue? And that means missing, murdered indigenous women. So the amount of women that are um, murdered and go missing on Indian reservations and just not even Indian reservation, just uh, in our country in general, because there's a lot of what they call urban uh, natives, right? Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of people who live in the city as well. Um, and for whatever reason, even the ones that live in the city are targeted and trafficked a lot. Um, there's a lot of rabbit holes we could go down on why all this is a factor and what's going on. I want to go deep. So, okay. Yeah. So some of them, I, I would say the biggest one of them is anywhere that there is poverty, there's human trafficking. So you could remove this from being a native issue and apply it to everywhere. Um, every single community that is underprivileged suffers from human trafficking. They're just more vulnerable. So, you know, they're from whether they're broken homes or like alcoholic and addicts in the family, you know, parenting them and all these different things. A lot of it's like generational, you know, that whole term like generational trauma. I, I don't know if I believe in that, but I, I know like if your dad's an alcoholic, like your life is different than someone whose father is not right. So we could call it generational. Mm-hmm. But it's so hard to break the cycle of trauma and tra- break the cycle of abuse. So what ends up happening um, in these areas is, is you know, if, if mom's a, a drug addict and she's bringing home boyfriends all the time and now you're a 12 year old girl and all her boyfriends sliding into your room and this that, and the other, like these stories are the norm versus a story. And I think that like one social media suppresses that big time. So does the media. Everything, every single thing that we, I basically run a run a nonprofit that's shadow banned because no one wants to talk about, no one wants to talk about human trafficking, no one wants to talk about domestic violence, you know, all these things. And and I'm kind of getting all over the place, but it's like, yeah, of course no one does because like everyone's favorite wide receiver beats the shit out of his fucking wife, and that's okay because he's really fast. And you'd be and surprised how many people. I think one thing that people because it's not something that we openly talk about all the time. I know a ton of people firsthand that have either been around some sort of abuse whether it's sexual or just physical or verbal so many of my friends have dealt with that in their life like close friends as a young kid or a young adult or or whatever and i think that that gets silenced a lot and it's not something comfortable to talk about i mean i grew up in an environment that was like that it was not fucking good no and it's it's hard to talk about too because um it, it's like the people who have a way out, you know, that maybe you were around, you had like an awesome uncle or an awesome grandpa or, or something that was like there for you to tangibly kind of grab a hold of and realize that like this is not right. This over here is what right looks like. And I'm able to get out of that. A lot of people never understand what right looks like. And this could be, you know, it doesn't even have to be, like I said, back to that poverty angle. I mean, this could be, you know, I think we all have, we know women 
who just make the most horrible decisions in men, it seems, right? Like they're always, their boyfriends are always shitty. They're always like, well, with this fucking dirtbag again or whatever. And it's easy to kind of, it's easy to victim blame or be like, oh, you know, she, this is her process. But it's like, how did she grow up? What happened to her where she can't break that cycle? Because she doesn't tangibly have something to show her what right looks like. She didn't have a father who treated her right. She didn't have the, whatever it is. So she never has an example of right looks like. She's basically trying to play this game of like, okay, is this guy going to be right? Like, no, that sucked too. Like, so she's just on, constantly in this turmoilist relationships. And that's very common in the domestic violence world in general is these women get um, abused and then they constantly, we call it breaking the cycle. They, there's just so hard for them to, to break that cycle of abuse and they kind of, they constantly kind of go back and forth in that. Now, if you add other circumstances, whether that's poverty or like, uh, you know, especially like sexual trauma, sexual assault. Mm -hmm. I would say there's another layer. You know, as a I woman, I think alcohol plays a huge role. In oh, it all too, the addicts, right? Like, so I, I can't, when I say addicts, uh, I'm saying alcoholics, drug addicts. You know, all those. If you just keep stacking layers and layers of shit on top of that, it makes it even harder. Now, when you go specifically to, oh, excuse me, um, Native women and in particular reservations. Um, most reservations, especially in the West, are in the middle of nowhere. There's zero jobs. There's nothing there. Amazon is not putting a warehouse on the Navajo Res. You know, it's not mm. like it's not like you're if you live on the Navajo Res, it's not like you have something to look up to. Even though they have awesome humans in that community, um, there's you know Farmington and Gallup and Flagstaff, and there's some cities there that they could get jobs and do things, and and you could thrive, right? And I'm not saying that there isn't that. But the problem is, is majority of those natives don't live there. They live a couple hundred miles away from there, the middle of nowhere. Uh, and now you've had gangs and cartels move in. A lot of it is cartel driven. And then if you're kind of looking at the, the hierarchy structure of gang related activity, the cartels are the top and they kind of filter everything. They don't have to, to deal with level. nearly as much law enforcement there either. You know what no, I mean? Not like, at all. Or if not any at all. all. No, not at all. And, and there's a lot of factors that go into play. Um, and, and, it, and it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to expose it all because I don't want to sound negative to my own community, uh, because there's a lot of native people who are really trying to, to influence this and, and, and correct this and, and stand up for it. At the same time, I look back to that government analogy. There's so much bureaucracy and layers of bullshit that it's not that there's not money thrown at this. It's not that there's not opportunity for this. It's that the money never gets to where it needs to be at. Here's an example. There are, I believe it's 516, it might be 517, uh, recognized tribes, nations in the United States. Only 111 of them have and implement the Amber Alert system and the Silver Alert system. Um, on the Navajo Reservation about a year ago now, all volunteer, they implemented the Amber Alert system and the Silver Alert system. However, here's how their system works. If you're driving from Flagstaff back to, let's say you're going from Flagstaff to Denver. So you're going to drive basically the length of the Navajo Res from Flagstaff all the way, you know, damn near Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. There could be three Amber Alerts happen on the Navajo Res and you would never get them because the only people who get Amber Alerts from the Navajo Res are residents of the reservation enrolled tribal members that physically live on the Indian reservation. So it's not net, is it not networked into the pipeline of like nope. the nine reverse 911 or what, however you get those on your phone? Nope. Really? Nope. And it's a volunteer system. So somebody who's volunteered to say, Hey, I will physically put this in the computer and add that. Um, and that sucks, right? Especially if you look at a reservation like Navajo res where like, let's say you live in, in Phoenix. And you're you're working construction in Phoenix, or you now you have a little apartment mm -hmm. there, but you're you're still Navajo, right? You still go to Monument Valley to see your parents or your cousins or your friends or whatever. Um, but you now that you're not living on the reservation, you're not in that Amber Alert system. You still wouldn't even be 
get receive receive those amber alerts and what kind of how are people receiving these amber alerts do they have to go and look for them or is no, it no, no. It's actual a, it's the same it's exactly the, the same, same way thing. it just has to be like you need to be put into the system so they only spread it through so many cell towers or the, something it, or no is they it needs to physically be in that system wow yeah so you have so, to register right what, but okay. when you look at it as a whole it's like well is there money for this? Is there funding for this? Is it, this, it seems like an easy solution, right? And then as you start to dive down everything, there's just layers of bureaucracy on top of that. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously funding in the police force is hard. Um, you know, they're just like most police forces in the country, they're undermanned, underfunded, you know, um, lack of resources. So the other one you need to add on there, kind of a, it's not as big, but it, it does, play into it is anybody from a small town gets this right like if i'm a deputy and everyone knows my kind of we all kind of know each other's business in a small town so they all know that they might not be able to prove it but they pretty much know i beat up my wife all the time and your wife is calling 911 and i show up what do you think how do you think she feels or receives that and we're cousins because on an interview back to small town vibe right like are you going to jail you know like or and that's you might you might be i might be a good deputy i mean by like hey bobby i get it you're you my cousin but law, like you broke yeah. the law dude you can't beat up your wife right so you have that as another aspect of it um and then you add on top of that the way a culture feels and oftentimes i think people that aren't native are quick to think like an Indian's an Indian, right? But like, we're not, we, we, we all have different cultures, different things we experience. You have different subsets within, within that, whether that's different bands, you know, but at the same time, like my family is a product of boarding schools. So like I grew up like a Mexican cowboy, like just straight Mexican, even though we we're Apache, it was just something that like my grandmother was very ashamed of about going to a boarding school, why she knows Spanish, why she speaks Spanish, like all these different things. So you have families like that. Then you have families that are raised like very traditional, you know, could live in like a, an adobe mud hut, basically no running water. Um, and, and a lot of that's not necessarily by choice, right? Like there's, right. again, back to there's nothing there for, for some of these families um, families to do. So you add all that on top of all these other factors that contribute to human trafficking, to addiction, to, you know, uh, you know just well, poverty. Well, and then if you, if you, I mean, organized crime seeks out sp spots like that and people that are in desperate need for a reason. Right, it's easy. Yeah. It's like you it's look at a pack target, of wolves, yeah. they're not going to, they don't hunt down the big bull, right? They right. go after the, the sick, old, young, young whatever. Yeah. So that is... Um, kind of a long way of trying to summarize some of the bigger picture issues that are going on on Indian reservations on why it's such a factor. Um, over the last few years, I don't know if it's necessarily because it's more in the line, like people are bringing more, raising more awareness about it, or if there's something happening with men, but a lot of native men are also going missing and are murdered. Um, a lot of it is, um, on some of these investigations I conduct, majority of it is kind of drug-related, bad actor, kind of gangish mm -hmm. activity. Uh, if you follow the the hierarchy, there but are- But we're like, talking young men probably here. Young, we are, we're talking right. young men. Yeah. A lot, some of it's young. You know, I, I w I've seen everything from, you know, teenage boys all the way up to, you know, old men. And, and uh, some of them, you know, have different factors, right? Like your runaway kids or your old man that's got, you know, dementia or something. Um, but I'll, oftentimes, you know, when you're talking that, you know, past teens to, you know, 50s, 40s, 50s, a lot of these men that are going missing, um, they, you know, kind of battled with like homelessness and, and uh, addiction and kind of have that, you know, kind of, I would, I'm not going to say that they're shady, but, you know, circumstances are, but, um, kind of live in the gray area of life, you know, at times it's up and down and, and they get kind of sucked in the wrong crowd or it's such a weird thing to like, I've been fortunate to work on some of those reservations, you know, whether it was in the film industry or rock and roll or <clears throat> whatever, some of the action sports stuff that I've done, like we did, uh, I was at monument Valley for like a month almost. And 
<clears throat> yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that if you take something away from people and yeah. tell them that they can't have it, it's more sought after, right? Yeah. So like, let's just use poaching as an example, right? Yeah. If you if you say, hey, you can't sell black bear gallbladders yeah. legally, then it puts it into the black market, right? Right. <clears throat> Same with drugs, alcohol. On those reservations when I was there, and I haven't been in some time, they couldn't even sell hygiene products. Yeah. Because people would misuse them, right? Yeah. But then what do you do when when you get around it? When you do drive to whatever the nearest yeah. town is, Moab or whatever, yeah. to get... I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, it's... Each place has its different nuances. The the biggest factor that I've seen working on multiple reservations is poverty, and it goes to like I said, there's there's no job, like there's no jobs. Mm -hmm. It's not like these reservations, you know, are in uh, a place that can that can have a lot of jobs. Now there are some that are different, right? Like if you go to like the Palo Res in San yeah, Diego, they're or not all like, like that. They're 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 not like that, right? Like guys that on the Palo Res, they but work they're in few and far or, between. Like you, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's not a um, especially in the West, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what I was kind of getting at with that is then it becomes a whole black market thing, right? Oh yeah. Like I don't know how many people I had approach me and say, "Hey, you want to buy some beer?" You know, and obviously you're. But they're doing it on the black yeah. market illegally. No, for sure. Yeah. Well, and then and then you add, you know, in particular with the women, with the with the native women, um, you know, we had the whole like Gabby, what was her name, Gabby Patino, uh, the white girl that went missing, mm -hmm. and you know, the media blew it up, and it is one of those things. It's like, was it tragic and horrible that she was murdered, and what happened to that woman? Yes. However, it's like we the media weighs who's more important than others. And it, and it also adds fuel to the fire being like, Oh, you care about the white girl, but you don't care about the Indian girl. And yeah, they don't like, mm -hmm. and, and the thing that I've seen in working with human trafficking, not just on the native side, but other places to me, it's a poverty thing. When someone poor goes missing or something's gone, like no one gives a shit, you know, and they all victim blame. She's a runaway or, but she's a prostitute or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I don't care if she's a prostitute or not. She's fucking missing. I don't care if she's a drug addict or not. She's fucking missing. Like, and we as a society, I think that's what happened in like the Gabby Patino instance is like, she's this like social media influencer that like, she's just a sweet little girl, blah, blah, blah. And they really like humanized her versus they have victim blame and someone else that's not to mention all the content that they had to per. Oh yeah. You know, to promote yeah. it basically. Yeah, exactly. Versus like, you know, like Hispanic girl or a black girl or or white girl from, you know, like you don't hear about like, like you, you can look at the opioid epidemic and like the Rust Belt, right? Like that's predominantly white people dying. Yeah. And and you don't hear about those women being missing and murdered and, and whatever. Um, I do believe it comes down to socioeconomic standing is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of those cases aren't talked about and and uh, kind of portrayed in the uh you know in in the media in general mm -hmm. um the other thing the media does and i said that we're like shadow banned you know for the content is i don't know why that i don't know if the conspiracy theories of you know the elites or you know drink baby blood and all this other crazy shit that could be going on i believe there's some evil ass people out there but the biggest thing to me is i think it's just ugly i think people just don't want to know that like people get off on raping kids and molesting kids or kidnapping women and murdering them or just and that, close that to that. them it could be happening oh. in this community right now oh, yeah. you know like yeah. it's just dark and ugly and we don't want to talk about that and and uh i think that that part is what another thing that kind of makes when you look at that umbrella of just human trafficking um sexual assault domestic violence like all those kind of things that a lot of times happen behind closed doors or things that we don't want to talk about, but we will openly talk about, you know, like other crimes or whatever, like th that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, again, we also run, a, a, our country's run off of money. So back to that, like everyone's favorite wide receiver, you know, beats the shit out of his wife. And that's fine. 
you know, like John Jones. Like, I don't give a fuck if he's the best fighter on the planet. He literally beats the fuck out of women, and like no one was willing to be like, "Hey, John Jones, you're fucking done." But and you, that's not the only bad decision he's made. He's made no. multiple bad right. decisions. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. But like, and he might be a nice guy going through a lot of shit, but it doesn't give him an excuse to put his hands on women. The problem is that like we don't immediately put a stop to that in our society when it when it deals with money, because if you're, you know, if you're a cop, right, and you don't have the money to have all these lawyers and all this shit, like if you get a DV charge, like you're done. You know, like you're not a cop anymore. Yeah. Your life's over versus someone else. It's like, ah, whatever. It's just, you know, so, you know, that's another subject. But I think that that's, I urge people to don't be scared to like point that shit out. Don't be scared to call somebody out. Don't be scared to be like, no, you fucking put your hands on women. Like that's not right. Or whatever it is. Don't be scared to do that. You know, you see someone fucking little kids, like fucking say something, you know, someone looks creepy. Find out if that's their dad or not. Like yeah. I do that shit all the time. I'm like, who are you, bro? And they're like, Oh, and I'm like, and they get all like, I'm so, and I'm like, okay, well you just look a little shady walking around here. Don't be acting like that. Or like whatever it is. But like, <laughs> but like people are just so, you know, they put the blinders on, dude, and they don't want to have anything to do with it until it hits them directly. Um, Which it almost has got to slap them in the damn face yeah. <clears throat> now because you do have all these other stimulants around yeah. you, like a cell phone to carry around. Or like, <clears throat> I was traveling yesterday, and I don't know how many people, the guy in the fucking handicapped golf cart at DIA is trying to get through yeah. to take this old and woman just... and like, and they have fucking earbuds in yeah. and like they're oblivious yeah. Yeah. to it. Oh yeah. So what if that was an active shooter oh, or 100%. what if a kid was getting yeah. kidnapped or yeah. something? No one, like no they one's, could... no one's switched on. No one pulls security. Anymore. Yeah. Well, there's no saber tooth tigers and grizzly bears for us to you right. know be scared of. It's, it's, it's safe. It, every, and I think that that's back to, you know, society. Like it's so easy in our country. Like it's so easy that you can basically disconnect and be in the middle of nowhere, have zero situation awareness. And for the most part, 99% of the people will be just fine. And Nothing I'm just as guilty of it as too. Yeah. Like when there's yeah. times when I don't want to talk to somebody on a flight, fuck yeah. I put yeah. it in my headphones exactly. and like pretend like I didn't hear them. You know, it's like, um, so back kind of, you know, summing up a lot of the native things. Um, another one I like to tell people about is, when I when I am talking about this, I don't always try to stay specifically in the native community because I think if I can get it to where you understand it as a father or as a brother or, or whatever, um, and you guys help outside of that community, we do too, we right? Do. Yeah. yeah, okay. But I think if I can get people from all walks of life, regardless of social economic standing, rich, poor, whatever, wherever you fall, all demographics to kind of make it a little more personal, then it's easier to understand exactly what's going on on, on the Indian reservations because it's just magnified times a thousand. So here's one I like to tell people what you were saying like it, it, until it hits you in the face, right? Um, grooming online is so popular and like everyone just hands their like five-year-old their phone to watch YouTube videos instead of babysitting. And as this grows, now you have, um, you know, 14-year-old girls talking to grown-ass men online um, could be something as simple as like, yeah, I put all these blockers and filters on and this and that. But it's like, hey, parents, do you know that you can message on Pinterest? Probably don't know that. Your kids know that. Your kids know technology better than you do and better than you ever will because they grew up in it from the time they were born versus learning it, right? Yeah. So what a lot of times what happens is you'll have, you know, let's take upper middle class like Lone Tree, Colorado, right? And parents wake up in the morning and 16 year old, you know, Rebecca is gone. They call the police. The cop shows up. The initiating officer, how he can, how he handles that case is going to be what happens with the uh, resources at hand. So if I'm the initiating officer and I get there and I, and you say, we woke up this morning, Rebecca's gone. Her daughter's gone, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, she's a runaway. So if I know nothing about what's going on and I don't do any kind of investigation and I call this in and say this is a runaway, it's not all hands on deck. It's a runaway. They're going to look for her. They'll put out, you know, whatever, maybe last knowns. They'll they'll try to find but her. But it kind of goes runaway. to the bottom of the pecking order. It goes to comes... the bottom of the pecking order because she's a runaway. Yeah. Other Some agencies have different. right? Right. Yeah. And, and I'm not speaking for all, all police agencies. Someone will probably be like, oh, it's not all true. For the most part, it's true. 
what happens though is we didn't realize that like Rebecca was being groomed online and she left in the middle of the night to go meet her 16 year old boyfriend, which is not her 16 year old boyfriend. It's actually a 30 year old guy that's been grooming her for the last three or four months who is an act thinks she's in love with and she's going to go be in a better place because mom and dad don't let her do exactly what she wants. And now she can't. So now she's trafficked. Now she's in the system. Now she's on drugs. So like this is how so when it, it comes to trafficking, let's just clear this up real quick because it's the moment that I think about it. I think a, a U-Haul truck with 30 women tied up in the back right. going to a brothel or right. of some sort, an underground brothel. That's, what automatically right. pops into my head, right? Right. <clears throat> Which there are cases that are, are like that. There are but, those cases. But trafficking can be as simple as what you just explained, right? Exactly. And then okay. a lot of times what you'll see, um, if anybody's ever been to like, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, like the red light in your town, the red light district, or you take, you're in a bad neighborhood or something and you see, you know, the prostitutes, they're not what you think of as like Las Vegas call girls who are like, you know, people think that these women are selling their body by choice and 99.9% .9 of them happened in a crazy situation. They might not have came from an awesome as house as Rebecca did, but they got there, they get on drugs. That's usually what they do is they'll, they'll give them some kind of a stimulant or, or you know, addict them to something mm -hmm. they need. And then basically kind of use that and hold that over their head like you're working for x um some people will say like well they're a prostitute they work this corner it's like yeah they're working that corner but like let me tell you the mindset of these fucking guys like this is my fucking corner you come on it and you're another pimp like i'll fucking stab you and i'll, I'll shoot you like i don't give a fuck right hey girl you want to work here cool how like 80 percent of everything you make is mine and she's like nope okay fine i just beat the fuck out of her and every single time i see you i'm gonna beat the fuck out of you until you're mine and I, and you pay me my money and now you live with me. Right. So it has like kind of like strong arm effect. There's also like the guys. It's organized that, crime. Oh, it is. It There's is, also yeah. the pimps that kind of groom very lovingly and like filling this void that their father was, didn't have or blah, blah, whatever it is. There's all these angles. These guys are fucking master manipulators. So a lot of times when you think human trafficking, again, it goes back to, you know, you think of, I think in the, today's day and age, we think of movies that we've seen because it, it gives you a picture, right? So you're thinking Taken or like some movie like that, right? right. Like these women Leslie are just drug, <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, and and the reality is, is, is it's, uh, it can be that drastic and it could be as low level in your mind as OnlyFans or pornography uh, or I've dealt with- I didn't even think about it on the well, virtual side because yeah, like dude. the whole OnlyFans yeah. thing, there's got to be some sort of pimp. Yeah. Stuff well, going I've, on in I've that dealt, or... I dealt with a woman that um, was in the porn industry and they would, they, the, their, her pimp, would keep her uh, three-year-old daughter in like the hotel room next to her and burn her daughter with cigarettes if she didn't do what she was told to do on camera. So now you take porn and porn's on another fucking level nowadays and you take the things that fetishes and crazy things that people are into and want to do and it's like yes are some porn actresses celebrities and want to do this i i don't know what they want to do or how they got into it but let's say yeah they did right but is there a lot that probably didn't want to be in a you know 40 guy anal gangbang like probably not dude you know well and i think it also goes back to like <laughs> It's almost, in a sense, it becomes your career, right? It becomes your identity, just like rock and roll is yeah. mine. I'm lucky I fell into that, and I'm not at a cubicle selling insurance over the phone or something, yeah. right? Because you become, you get a car payment, you get a mortgage, you get all this stuff, and you become almost a slave to whatever it is yeah. that is providing all that for you, right? Yeah. So it could just simply be financial. It could, yeah, no, it totally could be. So. But those are just different, um, some analogies or some of the things I've seen that just to get keep people's kind of mind rolling and being like, oh, wow, this is bigger than we think. And there's, there's way more into this. Um, so basically, you know, the statistics, when you talk about Native American women, I mean, it's astronomical. It's like four out of five will, re will 
you know, will be abused in their lifetime. You know, really? Yeah. The number, they're thirty percent more likely to be murdered than before they're thirty than any other race in our country. Um, one out of ten, you know, is murdered. I, I mean, it's the numbers when you just start to if you just Google, like you just start reading, you're like, holy shit. Um, one of the big numbers that does was, a lot of this happen on the reservation specifically, or is it? So, outside the so a lot of it's kind of taking both. advantage. A lot of it's kind of both, you know. Um, I would say I don't know the exact statistic. Um, the problem with that is you do have a lot of jur- jurisdictional issues. The one statistic that I did see um, is they the studies that came out, and I think the biggest one was in 2016. Um, excuse me, sixty uh, percent of the. Um, uh, what like aggressor, or not, you know, whatever were non-native actors. So, so, so outside influence into that community, outside influence in the community, to pull was, them out or correct. Yeah. 6% of like all those instances were, were from non-native actors. Um, as much shit as uh, kind of Ivanka Trump gets and the Trump administration gets, they did a lot of work for natives. She did a lot of work for instituting Savannah's Law, um, really trying to bring light on some of these. Um, what is uh, Savannah's Law? So Savannah's Law, Savannah was a um, a native woman in, I believe it was North Dakota, and uh, her upstairs neighbors, she was like eight months pregnant, and her upstairs neighbors kidnapped her, cut her baby out of her, and then dumped her body in the river. Holy shit. Um, and... They use that law to basically where um, agencies can can interact and share data and information um, easier because a lot of times a lot of the sometimes it's the, federal land, right? Well, it's so, federal, right? So, yeah. so unless you're like the, from the BIA, the FBI, then you're not going to get like the you know the um, Arapaho Denver County Sheriff's right, Office, right? Right. So, yeah. like, so like if you're in the Arapaho Police Department on on the wind river reservation you're 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 the, you're the wind river police department you're not sharing all your information with you know um the regular wyoming state patrol all those resources aren't going into play you know back to the scenario i was telling you like with rebecca right that initiating officer because he said it was a runaway is not on hands on deck let's say he's a little bit familiar with this so they receive some training and they're like hey let's go through some cyber stuff first Here's your checklist. Let's figure out maybe this girl's traffic when you go to runaways in general. Maybe there's a checklist for runaways at, you know, Jeff Jeffco, maybe say Jefferson County has a, a checklist. They look through it and he's like, I think this girl, this this runaway might be trafficked. So in that instance, now you would have state patrol on board. So the state once the states get involved and then the FBI and everyone, now you have like manhunt. You know, your helicopters are in the air, people are Amber Does some of this stem from out. the parents too? I think being, or whoever the closest family member is, being, uh, I guess, doing their deal, due diligence to say, hey, this isn't like them, or we want to investigate it this way, or that's hard because um, you don't know as an investigator. You don't know who the bad actor is. Right. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt because you might be trying to steer me in a different direction mm-hmm. while I'm conducting my investigation. Uh, so I think that, you know, does that make sense? Like you kind of got to, you kind of like yes and no. But if a parent's listening to this right now and they're like, oh yeah. shit, I never really realized yeah. this. Are there some certain keywords or something that you can insist on if you have a missing kid? At some point, I think that will help. I think uh, you know if you're a parent, you have to start young, as young as when they start talking. That like people are inherently bad, like so and so can't see your private parts and this or that, mm-hmm. right or whatever it is, and and you have to start these conversations of like, hey, little girl, I lost my puppy. Will you help me find it? And I'm walking up to you with the leash to be like no like i'm not like run like ah stranger i'd rather have them freak out and stranger danger at the park versus doing that right which a lot of it's difficult shit to talk about well and and it's also like kids are easily manipulated by by adults Mm -hmm. you know um back to like the you know sexual exploitation of young women think about like we're married but like let's say you're single you're you know, you're in your mid thirties, early forties, whatever, 
Like if you just hit the dating scene and like talk to like 20 year old girls, you, they're so like, not to like downplay younger people, but it's like, you guys are not very smart. The amount of like bullshit that like some guy that's smooth talking, that's kind of nice looking that, or, or, or just has, has a fake profile, has a fake profile, right? Like the things he can say and do and, and manipulate a young mind um, now add that to like a 14 year old girl versus, you know, mm. a 21 year old girl that they haven't at least had those dealt life with like, experiences. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think that like all of those things, it, it's a very complicated, twisted mess. Right. Uh, but <clears throat> back to, you know, reservations, uh, MMIW specifically, you have all those factors that come into play, you know, like, like I said, the property, one of the biggest ones, you know, obviously is the jurisdictional issues. Savannah's law did, um, did help out a little bit. Um, the governor, the governor of, um, Wyoming's done a pretty good job of trying to get all his agencies to be able to share information and talk, you know? Um, but as far as like, you know, law enforcement goes, I mean, you're kind of at the mercy of whatever law enforcement's willing to do as a parent, um, and then this is now where organizations like mine and especially in the native community, I mean, there's a lot, it's not like there's a little, a few organizations like trying to help. I mean, and yes, because I'm in this, um, you know, job field, I guess, or demographic, mm -hmm. um, I know, you know, they're all nonprofits, search and rescues, you know, sm and then when I say nonprofits, I mean, there are two or three people that are paying out of pocket don't know how to raise money, trying to get grants, you know, just trying to make it happen to try to help their community. You know, I have friends um, that now have a drone program right now where they got some funding, where they got a bunch of drones, where they're, able, they're trying to train people on the reservations to be able to, to, to utilize drones in searches. Uh, I have another, another friend of mine. She's um, works in the Navajo res. She's, she's Navajo and uh, she runs cadaver dogs. So she has her mm. own little search and rescue and she trains dogs and uh helps families conduct investigations but these are all resources that it's like why does the police department have that you know like yeah it, i mean and you look if you look at a patrol vehicle in on the indian reservation especially if it's a minor man oh yeah well look if you if you look inside of a patrol vehicle in the indian reservation there ain't no computer in there they're not running ncic there's a, there might not even be a radio in there yeah like they they're, don't, they're probably hot seat. They probably cars. don't have dogs either. I mean, no. yeah, no, the, the, that's kind of what I was getting at with the lack of law enforcement. Like the, those couple reservations, I had to work with law enforcement on those. And it was like two or three guys for the whole entire Monument Valley, yep. man. And we're yeah. talking about, I don't know what kind of training they've had or anything. No. It, it well, didn't seem like you're talking to an inner city cop or an investigator, no, 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 right? No, no. Right. Or they, an operator of any they, sort. Yeah. And they definitely don't have that same um, level of training. Mm -hmm. um, but to show you how close it is to home and how, again, most Americans are more alike than we are different. We're in Jefferson County. How many officers do you think are on patrol right now? And how big do you think they span? I, I, one of my buddies, he actually just quit uh, about a month ago, but he was responsible from I, t I from I seventy at Idaho Springs all huge. the way all the way down to to the lake to um, Cheeseman Lake. That's for his patrol area. There's no radio service from pretty much when he gets off uh, off the freeway. They, right. The mountains block everything, so he's going to calls, running code, driving forty five minutes to an hour to yeah. get to a a, a call. Um. So, I mean, if you think of like what could happen in that period of time, when, especially if you're trying to do an investigation or you're responding to something very deadly or very tragic, like there's a lot of things that go and into There's a that. lot of people that live in that area too, man, that are oh, yeah. dispersed living, I yes. guess, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I and, and Indian reservations are, are just like that. I mean, mm -hmm. they're very vast, very broad. There's stuff all over the place. Um it's easy for the bad actors to go in. I want to say it was uh, 2020, I think, the passed a law, the Biden administration passed a law where before, you, if you were non-native, you couldn't be prosecuted on the reservation. So a lot of these guys would just, people what would like- What the fuck? Really? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So- It should be a federal offense. I mean- It is now. Okay. So now you can be prosecuted for crimes committed on the Indian reservation, whereas before- 
It just wasn't. Mm -hmm. So what you'd have is you'd have these people who understand how that works. And then you just have bad actors, guys, just, you know, not, not saying good old country boys, cause that's a bad way to describe it. But you know, a group of guys jump in a truck and go shoot machine guns in the fucking desert. Well, they're on the res, so no one can fuck with them. You know, the res cops show up. Right. Fuck it, we'll get in a shootout like it's one dude and fucking like I don't care. You know, so like th there's so many people, especially if you think about these like rural areas where like zero people like con like they don't care. Right. Um. So you add just layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy of uh, different systems trying to talk trying to establish something and there's so much that gets lost in the madness and unfortunately what's lost right now in the madness is that you know social economic that lower economic mm -hmm. standard uh of living those people um and that's what i believe is one of the true contributors there's a lot of them but i think it's just opportunity like it, it's it's if you're you know cartel or or some gang member or just whatever like it the opportunity to to do what you want to do in the middle of nowhere it's wide open we just know? had a uh, john norris on from california game and fish and he started um God, it was probably 25 or 30 years a lot ago of out there dude just the cartels that yeah. are coming in and he's like it's not just mexican cartels no. that are like well, it's just all, growing weed. San Juan's. Like, yeah. San Juan's are the same way. It's insane. And, like yeah. some of the stories and the tactics that these guys take. I mean, yeah. like building punji pits, like from yeah. the Vietnam era, like, yep. and they had to do, I mean, full on SWAT team tactics. Oh, yeah. And then it was beyond that because they're not dealing with inner city stuff. So then it turns into almost like an operator mentality yeah. where they're getting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Know, for sure. Yeah. They're out. They're regular patrolling. Yeah. Um, yeah, dude. So. <clears throat> And so about a year ago, or a little over a year, about a year and a half, I started War Party Movement. Basically what it was was um, just an apparel company, and I was using the funds to um, try to assist the community where I can. And it wasn't just the Native community. We've we've helped, um, you know, all walks of life. Um, it just kind of, uh, I'm not going to say it was easier to be in the Native community, one, it was like something that was that my mother started and was really big in my mother. Obviously, she's Apache, so um, that was easy. But just also just the opportunity of like there's something – like these people need help more mm -hmm. than anyone else does. Um, and it's, it's hard because I was always one of those people who I like to show supporters where money goes and like what's going on. But oftentimes I can't talk about all the things we've done or be specific – and even on social media, it's hard because it's like I'm not trying to glorify that situation, but I'm also trying to respect the family and what and what you know what's best for them. But um, we've done things as as much as you know physically removing women from domestic violence situations and moving them to a new um, across the country. Um, you know, women on the run whose like life is in danger. They're you know there's from the cartel, which why the FBI doesn't have like witness wet sack or anything for them mm -hmm. but physically like removing them flying them stashing them in safe houses safe house to sit i mean shit that you wouldn't think happens in our country we we do um and to as simple as you know paying for therapy for a woman to, to you know hey what's next like okay well, right let's, let's get let's get therapy until we can get a a nonprofit to step in to get you and, out of and, that and situation. That. Yeah. Help, help kind of, cause I think cycle. that that's the biggest thing. You can help somebody all, all yeah. you want, but if there's not something lined up for the future, as we all know. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm glad that I did, did it in that way first and didn't start a nonprofit to try to do like a search and rescue nonprofit or figure out where I could work best. So by doing this for the last year and a half, the biggest thing I saw was when we would assist a woman, or a family, it's like now we're calling all these nonprofits to try to figure out where's the safe house, where can I take her, or church, whatever it is, where can we take her. Almost every single one of them is, an, is a 30-day program. So let's say, like, your sister is in an abusive relationship. She's like, hey, we need help. And you're like, hey, Jeremiah, do you can help? Like, yeah. And this is, the, this is her scenario. She has to leave there. There's no place for her to live. She can't live with kids. Let's say she, she's an addict. Well, he was alcoholic. She's an alcoholic, but it's bad enough where, like, she physically can't be around. Like, you can't have a beer around her. You know, mm -hmm. like, you want to be that. So she can't be in your home. She can't be here. So we're trying to find these places. We find a place for her to go. 
and let's say um, Albuquerque, New Mexico has got a facility she can go to. Well, what happens is she goes to Albuquerque for 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, it's like, well, your time's up. Now what? So like, I don't, my margins aren't that great. I don't make that much money. So if I spend, you know, 1500 bucks, $2,000 to get your sister removed from that situation, this is me like paying, you know, two or three guys on my background, not even paying, this is volunteer, like giving mm-hmm. them the gas money, feeding them, feeding her, buying her cigarettes, some clothes, like whatever she might need, you know, the couple hundred to bucks. To be in a good stuff, position to be, and yeah. have some protection exactly. along the way, right? Now yeah. we get her to, you know, we get her to this facility. When it's over, she just leaves. Like there's no, and why she's there, she's not like looking for a job. They're not teaching her about life skills. She's literally like on social media every day, bitching to the rest of the girls that are in there. It's like a fucking prison. So I had a woman that I assisted down in Pueblo. Um, She was an addict. Um, Got her in a 30-day program. Everything was looking awesome. I mean, she was doing really great. I was talking to her probably once, twice a week. Um, About 18 hours after she got out of the program, she overdosed and died. And I was just like... Fuck you, like this is it it's been like the hardest thing I've dealt with post military. In the military it was like all my buddies that died, they chose that. You know, the first answer to Ranger Creed is recognize that I volunteered as a ranger, fully knowing the hazards of my chosen profession. They died as warriors. They chose that life. So I don't mourn them in that respect. And I didn't I didn't have this grief or this feeling that I did. Now it's like, dude. It's, it's fucking heavy, right? Mm-hmm. And that instance was one of the things that made me think, like, there's got to be something we can do that's different from just this 30-day program, and they leave, and, and they're just back to the fucking win, right? So um, looking at some of the other veteran programs I'm connected to and saw going on, you know, like Heroes and Horses, like just a phenomenal program that's changing guys' lives. I looked at stuff like that and I was like, well, is there something that I could do that I love that I do every day? So I was like, okay, if I'm, you know, day to day life, I'm trying, I'm, I'm working as a cowboy or outfitting and guiding and doing all these things outdoors and day working. So I'm like, well, what if we started a program similar to like Heroes on Horses, but without the, you know, a different type of trauma, a different, he's got a little bit more of a mental, physical angle there where mine, I'm like, if the end state is to fix, to break the cycle. So now what we've developed is War Party Ranch is our nonprofit and War Party Ranch, what that is, it's a 10 week cowgirl program, essentially. So we bring girls from, um, across the country out to Colorado spend 10 weeks with us and then we help them find job a job in the agriculture industry or that's for a rancher for an outfitter for a boarding facility a horse trainer just to get their foot in the door but what it is is you know nature and horses are so healing and so powerful in general and it's like what better way to imp- to empower women to break the cycle of abuse and trauma by giving them a skill set 99 percent of the men in the country can't even do Right. Like, (laughs) you you know, and, and to work and to not only that, but like five years down the road, let's say, you know, a girl that comes to our program, she's no longer, she doesn't work on a ranch anymore. She's whatever. Um, when life gets hard, she'll kind of chuckle and think back to being like, it ain't snowing. Right. I'm sleeping in a bed tonight. So like the same, when you were talking about as a kid, you know, going on hikes and like crying and like having sort of adversity. And if there's one thing about the agricultural business is it's a job that never stops. Never stops. Yeah. So, so it's one of those things where like we're getting, we're empowering them. This awesome therapy We're we're on ranches, we're in the mountains, they're on horses every day. Uh, And then they're learning a skill set to be able to be completely on their own. So, we started this um, th- this this summer, and obviously this takes a ton of money to try to make happen. Um, we've kind of just been in the fundraising stage um, and trying to really make a name for ourselves, also in the Western community. And one ways that we've done that, some mistakes I've seen other programs make, is their cadre isn't quite the cadre we think they are. What I mean by that is 
if you if you're a, a retired operator, you're a Navy SEAL, Green Beret, or something, you start a shooting company, or whatever, and like you're actual like this badass dude who's highly trained, who's done all this, like people are gonna seek that business and want you to teach them versus a guy who is like, you know, sorry to say, but like you're a regular Marine, bro. Like you don't really know that much. Like it's, you don't have the same street cred, right? Sure. Not saying that it's not a good program. Not saying you're not a good shooter. Not saying you don't know what you're talking about. But what we've done is I pulled a group of um, just the saltiest, badass cowgirls you can think of. Almost all of them are from Colorado, but we also compete. So we've used a lot of our own money to compete in like ranch rodeos. Um, we're headed to Art of the Cowgirl in January um, to really showcase one, what we're doing. But if in the Western world, Western community, if we have real cowboys have our backs and we know that, that they're not bullshit, they know that War Party Ranch is like those, they're fucking cowboys, right? And we start to go to these ranches and work with these girls. And so like what the, what the program looks like in that 10 weeks is like, we might be in Nebraska for two weeks. You know, we might be in Wyoming for a week or whatever, work on these different ranches or different outfitters. And, and by doing that, we're, we're making a name for ourselves, but the hands and the cadre, the, the, the people we have teaching are also making a name for themselves. So it's not just that the girl is kind of OJTing and sure. and trying to like, Hey, maybe I might be able to work on Bobby's place, you know, in, 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 in a month, it might be, um, but we want to have that street cred, if if you will, you know, yeah. behind it. So yeah, one of the things, so what we did was we did a, um, our first fundraiser event was a ranch rodeo we did here in, in Kiowa, Colorado in September. Um, and it was, it was just phenomenal, man. We had, um, we thought it was just going to kind of be a small ranch rodeo. You know, we ended up having 26 teams out of the 26 teams. We had four teams to compete on a national, like four professional teams. Um, I don't know if, you know, the, the silver spur is, but the silver spur don't send hands to shit. And they sent four teams. Um, That's awesome. and you know, so those, are, those are big ranches. Um, so it was really cool to see that community come in and support it and then learn about what we're doing, right. To be like, Oh wow. You guys are basically taking female survivors of abuse, turn them into cowgirls and doing that. So basically in a nutshell, that's what we've done. And again, to show people, you know, where money goes and, and what we're doing. There was a, a native girl I've been working with for about a year um, on the war party movement side. Uh, she, we were just friends and she was just, she's just this awesome fucking human in her community and just a staple, just like one of the most genuine rock star like people and one of those people like you need to follow on social media if you're not, you know, like that type of person and also, and just genuine and does great work. Um, do you want to give her a shout out or is are I, we going I, to a spot I, where I we I don't want to give her a shout out only okay. because I, I don't want to take away from her story and make sure. her story. Mine. Okay. No, that makes sense. Um, but she, um, you know, uh, she was, she reached out one day and just we're friends, you know, and she's like, Hey Jeremiah, here's the deal. This is my situation. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Never, you know, like, wow. The more that I'm learning about domestic violence and how things work and how, you know, uh, when we're off talking about like abusers groom everyone around them the same way they groom their, the person they're abusing. So everyone thinks that like this guy's an amazing human. He's such a nice guy. No, she's got to be crazy. And they kind of play the girl to be crazy. And the reality is she's perfectly normal. She's being abused and you're being groomed and you're not aware of what's going on in this situation. So basically that was kind of the situation that she was in. Um, and I was like, okay, wow. Well, fuck. And I have seen that firsthand growing up as a kid. And I don't know if many people know this or I've, I don't think I've talked about it on here before, but <clears throat> my mother grew up as a single mom. My dad bailed early. I have uh step or I'm sorry, not step brothers, but half brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Amazing people. You would never even know that we weren't full blood. Right. Cause we grew up in the same house. She had made a couple bad decisions on character yeah. of men. And, uh, you know, starting with my father, one who wasn't around and just bailed on her. I don't think he ever beat her though. Um, but then I grew up in an abusive household and I was young. I mean like five, six years old and was, I remember like yeah. full on, you know, at one point my stepdad holding her down, he was a religious guy. Right. So my dad was biker club, biker trash basically. So my mom went the exact opposite 
and hired this super or er, hired <laughs> married the super hyper religious guy yeah. right and on paper sweetheart outstanding in the community uh you know stand up dude works a construction job uh was nice to everybody and was nice to my mom and me is you know for a few years until the true self came out yeah. right and I remember him at one point, like reading the Bible to her, holding her down by her hair and like beating her, you know, like yeah. just fucked. I mean, oh, yeah. totally deranged out of his fucking mind. Yeah. Right. Like there's I don't wish bad things on people very often, but it's still to this day, yeah, I wouldn't guy. mind if that motherfucker yeah, slipped that and broke his neck <laughs> going down the stairs, you know, yeah, like, that yeah. Or, you know, it, it, I had seen him later in life and was able to uh, I'm not even going to go down that yeah, road. No, but but anyways. I was a young enough kid that I couldn't do anything about yeah. it, right? And I didn't know any better. I didn't know that this was normal or not normal, you know? Yeah. And fortunately, like you mentioned earlier, I don't know if you've read me or if I've told you the story, but I had an amazing grandfather and uncles yeah. around me on my mom's side that sh were able to show me what a man is supposed to be, how right. he's supposed to treat a woman. Like, I know one of the one of the sayings that sticks in my head is like, the best thing that you can do as a father is love the kid's mother. Oh yeah. I yeah. mean, and treat him with respect yeah. and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And my grandfather was that sort of man. Yeah. So I had this one outstanding example and then the exact opposite. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyways, long story short, my mom got out of that situation at just the right time, I yeah. think, before something really bad could have happened. And uh she she got in another relationship and the next guy was even more extreme and yeah. same thing. It went on for months where he was a great guy, a great guy to be around, mm -hmm. fun guy to be around and drugs and alcohol one night. And luckily this time I was old enough to intervene, but uh, I came out to my, I, or I woke up to my mom. I think it was like a school night or something. I think I was maybe 13 or 14 at the time. And I woke up to her, you know, screaming for me and he had her at knife point. Jeez. in the fucking in our kitchen small house and i i went straight after him and luckily i mean nothing happened to to my mom or yeah. me during that and he got arrested i'm still in prison over yeah. that which is good but still it's like i i don't know where i was going with that it totally threw me for a sidetrack there but i think that Unless you can openly talk about it, and I can because I'm yeah. comfortable with where I'm at and how I am, and I've seen, I've had that good example, but just growing up in that sort of environment, it made me turn into a man automatically at yeah. 13, right? It was like, yeah. okay, no more kid shit. Right. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to fucking, I'm going to be a man. Yeah. You know, no, that's, so I think, yeah, that's, and that's powerful. That A lot of that's too is because, like you said, you have that tangible, you know, your grandfather, your uncles, be able right. to like show you what right looks like. So, you know, kind of where we started was basically because what happens is, is like we said, that the abuser is grooming everyone. It's not just mm -hmm. grooming the person they're abusing. Oh, that's where I was going with yeah. it. These guys on paper, if you went to the grocery 100%. store, you would never guess it. No. You're like, oh, the nicest guy no. in the world. Or you people know, around the them that work Hold with them. the door for a woman, but yeah. then hold my mom down and, yeah, exactly. you know, Be, you know whether they're at church yeah. or whether they're gym or whatever the case is, their Correct. social setting, everyone around them is like, this is an awesome person. Um, and that's basically, you know, kind of where we were at. And, you know, she told me what was going on and, and I was like, whoa, shit, this was, uh, or is not was, this is a woman that, um, I look at as a, one as a staple in the community, but also helping me people that I want other women to be like, like this is, you know, so it's one of those things where like, if it's going to happen to her, it can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what we did was, um, so she shoots a trad bow. She's an archer um just badass just you know grew up in monument valley uh, very outdoors super fit um and what we did was i, I asked her i said i you know i was like to the board i'm like hey we want to um one of the possible job fields these girls would go into is to be an outfitter to learn how to pack and be able to t you know do that eventually maybe if they, they like that they can grow into being a guide or what have you right so i was like well what better way to tie this all together by kind of showcasing what hunting and 
actual like what that what that journey is like as well right we're not a hunting nonprofit but we're about empowering women through you know mo- if you look at our mission statement it's about horsemanship and and to the ag world mm-hmm. but outfitting directly ties into that it really does because a lot of those like especially on the western slope a lot of those ranchers during the hunting season make a oh, yeah. extensive amount of profit for their for their business yep. out of outfitting, yeah. right? And a lot yeah. of hands, a lot of guys, a lot of a lot of a lot of cowboys are out working. They um, you know, and as soon as like kind of hunting season starts, they're looking to get some more tips, some more money and they're packing, they're you know, so so it's just another angle excuse me, uh, for jobs. So what we wanted to do was how do we kind of tell this story and tie it all in but also like give someone an, an opportunity in their lifetime to really like to heal them and just what can we do? Because part of it was, yes, we raise money at the ranch rodeo, but we're unable right now to bring in, you know, just a bunch of girls and put them through a program. And, you know, it's going to take hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. Um, so in the meantime, I was like, you know, we have a couple thousand dollars, like let's do something. And uh, so what we did was we, we hooked her up with, with uh stick sniper down in oh, Tucson. Dude. So well, we've so, had Caleb on. He's yeah. fucking so, um, man, awesome guy. So Jenny Shiplet uh or Shipley was, you know, her dad Pete and and they uh are friends with them and they were like, hey, we let's do this. So PSC Bows hooked us up with Stick Sniper, uh, went down there, she got her a bow, um, we hooked her up with some mentors to shoot with. So this was in like July. Uh, we were able to start this kind of going and then she trained and and uh shot and, and did everything and then in september um we took her on an archery elk hunt one of the mentors that we were able to partner her with was was um dana monroe awesome um, Love Dana. she's a badass and and as far as like you know um back to you know a role model right like mm-hmm. you know if even if you're a dude if you're not following dana you're, you're a fucking piece of shit or you're you're dumb um awesome human but also just like an example of so many different things i'm an outdoorsman of Mm -hmm. you know an archer so they um linked up started talking and and talking shop and and getting everything going uh dana came through you know obviously with like her sponsors and we're able to you know close from sitka and and black rifle and and whatnot and we we took her we did uh we did eight days in the zirka wilderness um Everything didn't go as planned as we wanted to. Uh, kind of last minute, um, I had been scouting and getting everything together. Uh, last minute, um, the my two horses, one of my horses is a ranch horse. I, I worked them pretty hard gathering because like, it was you know the fall's coming, so we're getting ready to to ship and get everything going. And I just had a, a probably two hard weeks in a row. Uh, and he was done. I, he was he was he was a little bit lame. So I was like, I can't take him. And then I had another one that year, you know, a two year old. I'm like, I was gonna pack, but I'm like, I'm not taking him by himself without you know another horse with him. Right. So anyway, so everything kind of fell through. Uh, that was my kind of plan B. My plan A was we had um, badass family, uh, cowboy family out of Colorado was just gonna take us in. Just hey, we don't want no money. Just that's how they are. You know, that's they just awesome. wanted to give back. Um, their kids got really sick, like the Sunday before we were getting ready to roll and it was bad sick. So I was like, Oh man, how are we going to make this happen? So everything didn't go as planned the way we wanted to as an organization to be able to tie in, you know, the cowgirl with, cause that family, you know, the, the wife is this badass cowgirl. Um, so she was going to be, and she's a hunter. So I was going to have her and Dana basically kind of mentoring along on this trip. All that didn't happen. Needless to say, we spent um, a week in the circles chasing elk, got on elk almost every single day, except for like the, the super rainy, crazy day, two days we had. But um, just a life changing experience for her uh, to be able to do that. And, you know, uh, for me, too, it was so rewarding. It was one of my favorite hunts I've ever been on, even though we didn't, you know, harvest yeah. an animal. Well, just being out there for me, like, you know, whether you fill your tag or not for me yeah. it's all it's more about honestly i don't even and i get shit for this all the time like i enjoy to go into 3d archery shoots yeah. more than i enjoy hunting almost you yeah. know just um but for me it's just more about being out there yeah and disconnecting from everything it's so good for you it's man. so, it's good. so and, good and like 
you know, um, as her first time hunting, this is setting up for her up for success to be able to do this in the future, to teach her kids this, um, you know, just, and to be a part of what we're doing, you know, um, so, you know, full circle, yes, the hunt didn't go as exactly how we wanted to, but it was an amazing experience all the way around. Um, and you know, she'll be hunting for the rest of her life now and, and using this as kind of a, a, a platform to, to, you know, to uh, springboard, if you will, to, to start that. Sure. The other really cool thing is when we were talking about, you know, this 30 day program and, and what can we do? My biggest thing was like everyone I bring in, that's a part of this. I want them to receive something out of it as well. And every one of our board members, um, there's one other male, it's me and another guy and everyone else is a woman, um, badass, just crushing whatever industry they're in. I have everything from one of the best tattoo artists on the planet to like one of the, like the best cowgirls in the is country. Is that Marissa, Marissa. Lynn? Yeah. yeah. Man. So Marissa is on the board. Yeah. She's yeah. awesome. Um, you know, and my co-founder, Micah Waisaki, she's, you know, like just my long lost little sister. She's, you know, one of the most phenomenal and I mean, has the trophies and been there, done that, got the t-shirt to back up how badass a cowboy she is. Um, so we have everything from, you know, from that to, we have journalists to, um, the president of our board actually ran safe houses in Cambodia. Um, so, I mean, we have some really, really awesome stellar gals that sit on our board and again, not to tell anyone else's story, but they all have their own experience in, domestic violence, uh, some, you know, horrible situations in that way. Um, so I wanted this to be a way to not only to, yes, starting with the board members, but if I look at each one of them, what are they, like, I want to be able to break the cycle, but almost start a new cycle of like giving back, of starting something over. It's like, this isn't the book. It's a chapter of the book of your life. Let's not make this one chapter, the entire book. Let's make it a chapter. Doesn't mean you can't read it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't mean it's not there. But let's start something new. It's just like looking at that history quote that you posted the other day. Yeah. It's a learning lesson, right? Oh, exactly. Not, not absolutely something to to dwell on, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, so all the women that are uh, that are partnered with us, whether they're instructors or they sit on the board, they all are also doing something where they're give, getting, they're receiving as much, you know, as as uh we all are because it i you know that i think like having cu my cups full now you know yeah. like you're, you're you're doing something rewarding you're seeing you're seeing these women's lives be changed even if it's so, even if it's over you know a week-long hunting trip you're seeing the effect of that and with this woman in particular um she uh lives on the navajo res like i said she's a staple in the community she's going to be one of our act um like activists i guess or uh, contacts, if you will. Um, and I look at her, you know, she's part of the team now, you know? Uh, so what she'll be helping us do is vet some women. We do, we're not pulling all of our students from the native community, but you know, probably about 50, 50, you know, pretty, pretty heavily. But what that'll do is she will help us be able to find the right candidates from someone, you know, from where she knows, um, you, you know, as, as we're building out this, uh, this full on program, so that's awesome, man. And I think the mentorship that can happen there too, you know, maybe some of these women that have gone through your program can then mentor. Oh, absolutely. That, other... and that, and that's where I see, you know, like the role I played on this hunt, um, or even, you know, quite frankly, the role Dana played on this hunt, you know, next year let's have, um, I don't want to, I almost want to say her name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's have her replace Dana and, you know, like I'm replaced with a girl that went through the course that's now packing and taking them out and doing this. So I feel like there's a way to create something where we're constantly, you know, in, in special forces, we, you want to work yourself out of a job. So that's like what I want to do. I want to be able to like bring these girls in and then have them be, you know, maybe one of them's, maybe I do have an opportunity to say, Hey, the, the, the little, the barn dominium, the little condo or the little apartment above the barn, like you can live there. You can be a ranch hand. This is what you'll do, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's where we'd like to be and what we want to build out to. Um, obviously, a lot of that is, is, you know, financial dependent of us raising money. Um, but at the same time, I mean, 
the model, what we've designed is um, pretty straightforward. I think it's going to be, you know, we'll be able to get a lot done with a little by the way we've done it. And what we're doing is we're, we only take students in the summertime. Um, so ideally, you know, everything goes perfect over the next few months. The goal is to take four. Um, that's like the, the high goal, the low bar goal is to take two. So what we want to do is run four women next summer for 10 weeks um, and put them through this course and then help them get jobs, uh, whatever that looks like, whether that's, you know, like I said, with an outfitter or, you know, or with on a ranch or a boarding facility or whatever it is in the ag space. And the vision behind that is to take, let's say, uh, a girl from, you know, Mississippi in a bad relationship. She's got, you know, like, Hey, this is what I want to do. I want to be a cowgirl. Like I, let's, let's do it. Bring her from there to Colorado for 10 weeks. Um, she shows up and, you know, you know, a pair of jeans and vans, like we give her everything she needs. She gets, she gets all her kit. She does. She learns to be a cowboy and then we help her get a job. And, you know, now in, in September, she's up in Montana working at a ranch, um, completely removed from her situation. Uh, oftentimes one of the biggest inhibitors for these women that are trafficked, regardless of background, is financial stability, whether that's trafficked or domestic violence situations. A lot of women can't leave their abuser because it's it's, it's not as simple as just leave. Well, what where do I go if I leave? I, I, what do I do? You know, sometimes their entire identity is caught up in this person. Maybe they're maybe they're uh, a big CrossFitter, and they got a hundred thousand followers on their and they're this awesome CrossFit person, but their husband's also the awesome CrossFit person that everyone loves, and he beats the shit out of her. How does she leave that situation that she's financially tied to because they own a gym together? Blah blah. Like that's just an example, because I think people don't quite understand how. Uh, like how close it hits to home. Like right. You know, some, I guarantee you know somebody that's in this situation. So, um, that is our plan. And that's where we're going with, with the nonprofit side of it. That to me is a bigger long-term solution than just throwing four or 500 bucks, you know, to get a cadaver dog out or a drone to help a search or conduct an investigation because those things are important. But what I think is more, more important and, in the small circle of, you know, the community I've come to, to know and, and help with these investigations and stuff, especially on, in the native community is there's no what next, you know, um, you, which is almost the most important part. So it, I think it, you're hitting it the nail on the head. It has right? to be the most because important Because if not, you're just going to fall back into that cycle potentially. Right. right? And, and the thing is, is like, how do we break the cycle of that abuse? But then, like I said, we want to start a new one. So if I if it's a fast forward, you know, 10 years from now, when a girl who came through our course when she's, you know, 18, and now she's 28 and she's a mom, was she able to, like, not make those same, you know, decisions and mess up? You know, like, was she able to make smart decisions? Is her, is her husband, like, this an actual awesome human? And yeah. she raising her kids and all these different things that we grow. So it's like... It's not just a short-term fix. This is a very long-term fix. And yes, four women a year isn't a lot, but it is a whole fucking lot. You know, when you, when you really look at impacting those women's lives, it doesn't seem that big. And I think that... Well, just the stability that you provide for them then, right? Either, yeah. Whether it's mentorship or knowing that they have a community or somebody that they can look up to or, or a long-term um, goal in mind, right? Yeah. So absolutely. That's awesome, Jeremiah. I'm really glad that uh, you came came back and we were able yeah, to man. talk about it, dude. And <laughs> yeah. I learned a lot about it today. You always have a platform here for yeah, anything you, that you guys it. are doing. Yeah. I stand behind you 100% yeah, okay. on all of that. And, uh, yeah, if there's any way that we can help or, you know, if the, if any yeah, of them sure. want to get involved in media or their own thing, yeah. dude, you guys always got a spot here, yeah, too. Yeah, so I'd, I'd be glad to mentor somebody or yeah. – or help them out with well, even some even uh, this stuff. summer. This summer, once we when we have our program going, um, you know, I always tell people like reach out. People always ask, "How can I help? How can I help?" You know, and a lot of times I just you know, if I'm running a program, then I have volunteers and I can do things. But even this summer, man, you guys are more than welcome to come out, come check out what we're doing. Um, awesome. I'll kind of keep you filled in on like where we'll be at. Hey, we're gonna be at this ranch or here or whatever. But sure. 
you know. And how can uh how can people reach out to you now? Is there a website or something? Yeah, so, and if somebody wanted to donate money, I'm sure that's greatly yeah, needed. Awesome. Or we definitely need go get some badass. Like your guys' logo and everything yeah. is fucking awesome for a war yeah, party. Like, appreciate it. Go get. You guys got yeah. some awesome hoodies and yeah. beanies and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, war party movement is um, again that's kind of shifting into more of an awareness platform. It is apparel. Um, I do need to do some some revision on the website stuff, but basically what War Party Movement is now is support arm for War Party Ranch. Um, and then WarPartyRanch.org is the website for the nonprofit. Um, donations, always, we always need that. I, I hate like, you know, begging for, help me, I'm poor. Um, but uh, we definitely can't get it done without people supporting, whether that's buying apparel or donating directly. Uh, and again, like I said, I, I want to always be like full transparency of what we did, you know, and, and right now we were able to spend that money on a bow and a, a life changing hunt for a woman. Um, and in the future, that's going to be, you know, put in this awesome program and, and jobs and changing these girls lives. So every dollar goes to that, you know, um, and uh, yeah, super cool. I'm just blessed. Super rad. Uh, yeah. Just is super don't blessed, be man. a punto. Is that part yeah, of the? Don't be a punto. <laughs> don't be a punto. I do sell on the website. I don't necessarily advertise okay. on my on the oh, work party. But, All right. Thanks, Jeremy. But uh, but yeah, don't be a punto. Just it's easy. I, I made them because it was started as a joke, but uh, I was like, oh, I'll see if anybody <laughs> wants this, and uh, people love them. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of funny because it's just a play on you know, just be a good person. Don't don't be a Piece Which shit, I think is you know? the key. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Are you still uh, doing any of the stuff with clandestine or anything? Um, Matt I have, Lingo or I have, have you seen Matt lately? I have not seen Matt. I miss yeah. that dude. Um I've uh, last time I worked with the guys was um in, in Jackson this winter. Um I just been so damn busy on yeah. my own thing. Um love them to death. They're they're still awesome crew. Um Great always guys. support what I'm doing. So um definitely blessed to have you know to to have kind of met them when i retired from the military and you know they definitely taught me a lot about media and 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 content you know in general but uh no i haven't done anything with them since i believe like february i just this whole summer i mean i've just been non-stop well so you had to put the modeling career on back burner (laughs) (laughs) yeah and then and then i uh grow the the stash so yeah it's a full-time job i'm sure (laughs) it's looking good man yeah thank you jeremiah i love having you in here thanks again bro um you're welcome back anytime we've been going for a couple hours i know you got to get out of here pretty quick and uh yep but yeah you're welcome anytime dude keep go follow war party uh, check out Jeremiah. Your personal Instagram is uh, Jeremiah underscore Blackbeard. Okay, give him a follow. You're really good at keeping up with uh, everything that you guys got going on on yeah. there. And if you want some good humor, go give him a follow. <laughs> Jeremiah, thanks, bro. Thanks, Love sure. you, brother. Side podcast if you haven't had a chance to do this already please take a moment follow like subscribe or rate on whatever platform you catch the mountainside podcast at also if you'd like some more information on upcoming episodes safety tips access to all of our affiliates and all the badass discounts that we get here at the mountainside podcast check out the mountainsidepodcast.com